OK, so I think we're going to start now. So hello, everyone, and thank you for being here today to our webinar dedicated to artificial intelligence and big data in Asia. My name is Mishket Ben Ahmida. I'm the marketing project manager at Datum Academy, and I will be your host for this event. So for this edition, we are honored to welcome among our speakers Valérie Ayotte, EMEA Director of Oracle Skills Development at Oracle University, Marlon Yamsi, Lead Solutions Consultant at Google Cloud and Partner Engineering, Dr. Manisha Vinodi Ramesh, Dear Director of Amrita Center for Wireless Networks and Applications, Dr. Shiam Diwakar, Director of the Amrita Mind Brain Center, Engineer Debi Prasad Pati, Delivery Lead Cybersecurity Practice for Tata Consultant Services, Dr. Myun Jun Kim, President of ETRI, Professor Antu Nguyen T, Deputy Director of Danang International Institute of Technology, Professor Kyung Liu, the Department of Intelligence, Science and Technology Director uh, at Beijing Information Science and Technology University, William Wei, uh, Foxconn Technology Group, CTO, sorry, of Foxconn Technology Group, Dudu, Vice President of International Development and Senior Engineer at Skill World uh, Business School, and Professor Serge Miranda, Scientific Director of the Master of Science BR, and at Estia and president of Datum Academy. So some speakers like Marilyn Yamsi and William Wei uh, were not able, unfortunately, to join us today, but they have sent us a video of their presentation. So if we display a video, please do not hesitate to raise the volume of your computer or phone in order to hear them properly. You can write all your questions and remarks in the chat all along the presentation, and we will answer them at the end of the event. So I wish you all a very good event, and Professor Serge, I now give you the floor. Professor, you just have to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you very much, Mishket, for this introduction, and great pleasure for me to be here at this round table with uh, friends from Korea, India, uh, Vietnam, and uh, and of course, and China. And um, so I, I have two parts in my presentation. Um, next, please. I yes. think. Uh, yeah, two parts. So the part one concerned, let's say, a strategic vision of the future of ED tech and um, and also some uh, synthesis concerning France and eventually Europe in this very important area of um, uh, computer science today. Um, the point, the very important point is that uh, I just quote here Jim Gray, uh, Turing Award in 98. Uh, we said we enter the fourth paradigm of science, a paradigm which is data centric after physics, after mathematics and computing, the first wave of computing. Now we are entering a world where data will be the major uh, raw resource. And concerning data, we have, uh, from a computer science point of view, we have two um, dimensions, data management and data analysis. For data management and data analysis in the future, we'll have the cloud. And and concerning, um, uh, concerning this, I will return to that point later. Um, from a university point of view, we are facing major changes, also due to the fact that 10 years ago, the MOOC revolution was there, and then the pandemic was there, putting a focus on e-learning. And we are here facing a demand due to the fact that AI and uh, big data um, will um, touch every sector of the economy. We are faced with a, a major demand from the market in order to educate uh, both computer scientists and managers to AI. And that co correspond to the skill tsunami. And we see the answer in Europe is what is called in Europe a gradio. A gradio is a package of academic course and professional course in order to meet uh, the demand of upscaling and reskilling. So there is a move and there is a new dimension in universities of the future, which will be as a, I would say as a conclusion, a blended learning aspect with courses face to face and with um, online courses, 
could be 100%, could be 50%, whatever. But that's a rule for any university in the future. And in some areas of the world, like Africa, where the population will double by 2050, then we need to have this dimension completely alive and completely developed in order to meet that demand. Next. So here concerning the skill tsunami, um, uh, there is um, figures I will not comment here, but you will have a, uh, on the slide uh, the importance of the fact that every job will have a digital assistant. And in order to build the digital assistant, university have a key role in building what the word which is important is POC proof of concept or POC proof of value. The creativeness of university are there in order to participate to this ecosystem of creating POCs. And that's part of the future of AI. In terms of theory, we have a huge demand. Uh, we have a huge offer. In terms of practical, we need more offer. And that's part of what we call learning by doing, learning by doing innovation, learning by doing POX. Next. So rapidly, the four ages of AI. AI is born in like a computing more or less in the 50s. Uh, the word appears in 1956. And um, AI is both a science from a, an academic point of view and an engineering part. Uh, science means research with um, uh, in, um, mathematics, with both statistics and optimization, research with um, bio doctors like uh, you will see the presentation by Sham, people working in the brain and people working in the digital brain and in the biological brain. So people have to work together. That's AI science. And we expect a lot of research in the future in that field. And then there is a second area, which is AI engineering. AI engineering means application and services using AI for a digital assistant. Some people talk about digital twin. Um, we may have in the future. And that's where our contribution in France is uh, and in Europe is important in the fact that we build BR master degree regarding this and MBDS uh, from the University of Nice and BR from Estia. So there are four ages of AI. I would say uh, until 2012 uh, and 12, uh, I call it I we call it symbolic AI with rules and mathematics expert what we called expert system at that time, and then since 2002. Uh, a data centric AI with a revolution introduced by deep learning. And deep learning, the people who created deep, le deep learning and a, var a variety of deep learning called convolution uh, deep learning, they got the Turing Award, the Nobel Prize in Computing, um, two years ago, three years ago. So that was a clear revolution, which is due to two points GPU, the power, and big data. So there is a couple big data and AI, which has to be thought in any system of the future of AI engineering. And we enter this age three during 30 years in front of us. Every job will be impacted. Every human activity, private, public, professional will be impacted. So we'll have here plenty of opportunities to build POX at university. And that's part of, uh, um, of AI from I would say driving a car up to agriculture, every field will be concerned. So 30 years in front of us for data engineering, AI engineering. And then beyond 2050, that's a beautiful question mark called strong AI, where um, consciousness will appear there and the generic um, AI, meaning not only vertical and uh, monodisciplinary, but multidisciplinary AI. But that's question mark and that's be part of U2P today. But we enter a very important age of AI. Next, please. So in France, there is a document called um, uh, France 2030 in terms of uh, teaching AI, uh, which is called the National Strategy for AI. And uh, we use them uh, in order to build uh, the curriculum of the BR master degree, BR means tomorrow in Basque language, means also 
big data intelligence for human augmented reality. So two years ago, we built in AI engineering for the third age of AI, this master based also upon this French framework and European framework. Next. So they start by identifying three key jobs required in the future. Data scientist, data engineer, and data application developer, developing an application on web or mobile for AI. So you, you will have this uh, definition here. I will not comment. Everybody should know what is now a data scientist and a data engineer. Next. And that's interesting is that what are the targets for such um, teaching of AI? And you have two types of target, the computer scientist and the managers. And inside these two basic targets, you can, the French uh, clear, clearly identify three levels with from computer scientists from <clears throat> already AI programmer, then general purpose computer scientists. We need to have upskilling towards um, AI and basic technicians. We need also to know what kind of services AI could provide them. And same for managers from the simple citizen to the key decider in the company. So when building um, Gradios, we have to have in mind these targets. I take a, um, a slide from the US last year, the new foundation skills for the digital economy, and you will see exactly the same digital building box, and they put soft skill around human skills and business enablers, and concerning the digital building block, blocks will find exactly the same as in the French vision, data management, <coughs> data analysis, application development, cloud and cybersecurity, because the future of data management and data analysis will be in the cloud, 80%. Next. So we have a 30 years of um, practice in at University of Nice with MBDS master degree, working closely with industry in order to build in this area of focus here in big data management, in data management, something which is <clears throat> unique in France um, and um, where we put inside the curriculum an innovation park where the students sponsored by industry where the students have to work. And from that experience of 30 years experience, we build EMBDS um, and we put in the market the first uh, European um, uh, certified online master degree called EMBDS with Oracle. And, um, and then follow a year later, EBR, more focused on AI at Estia School of Engineering in Biarritz in the southwest of France with Google and Oracle. Next. And the major lesson I would like to emphasize the fact that we focus on this curriculum on learning by doing. Innovation, that means there were an innovation lab with financial sponsoring from industry in order to have the students have a practical experience in here big data management. And that was the side effect were very important. Knowledge creation. So every time we took a new technology concept, a tool, we integrate them within a, a POC. Then sustainability, the program lasted 30 years. So that's at the university level is a very long uh, term and still in the best French master degree in computer science. And then visibility from industry, that means employability for students. Next. So EMBDS was launched in Paris um, um, uh, in 2009 and it's still available. It's, still, it's uniquely in English and um, direction is <clears throat> And we're using a fun platform, which is a French MOOC platform to do that. Still available. So conclusion part one, uh, the, this part one, I, I would just emphasize three po two points or three points. Um, on the fact that um, we are working on, uh, we need online certified and professional degree in order to put in the middle learning by doing which in, in the area of AI engineering, in this third phase is fundamental to the society. And then we're facing the skill tsunami, the need to educate 
both computer scientists and managers in every aspect of the economy, in every, in every field. Next, you will see um, the slide of what we propose uh, within that um, vision. No, previous, please. And we're going to command. And that's kind of the presentation of um, part two. Uh, it's um, so we create a Datum Academy within Estia. Um, it's a startup, but uh, Estia so School of Engineering is um, uh, creating is a co-founder of this uh, company, and it's inside Estia today. And our vision is to build what we called. Um, and an institute of AI engineering in three years, integrating a bachelor uh, on applied AI and EBR master degree, the two years of a master degree in um, computing. And of course, we have EMBDS in English. And I put in yellow what exists today. It's the second year of a master degree, which is called EBR. And of course, e EMBDS, which is also master two. Then we have the data lab. We have the Data Lab Innovation Lab at Estia, um, and in every connected digital campus, we create uh, some connected digital campus, as so you will see in the world. And we are discussing with uh, in China with the Silk Road Business School, in India with Amrita University, in Danang with the University of Danang, um, and in uh, with A3 in Korea, in order to have connected digital campus in Asia. We need a formal agreement with Estia, with Datum, in order to build this as an enrichment of an existing master degree there. And then we have four gradios, which correspond to four blocks of skills of the master degree, three with Oracle and one with Google. Next. So we have uh, these two master program, and I will rapidly overview them, and you have questions we will answer, either Mishke or myself. Um, next. So just one slide on STR saying it's a school of engineering depending on the University of Bordeaux, the unique school of engineering in the Biarritz area, which is a beautiful area in the southwest of France called the Basque Country. And we within the computer engineering field, we have this BR Master of Science on Big Data and Artificial Intelligence. So one slide on BR to explain that there are two things. The face-to-face -face Master of Science in Biarritz with a strong international partnerships. Um, we have a special partnership with the University of Siena in Italy concerning AI, machine learning and deep learning, which is supposed to have the most important research center in uh, AI in Europe. And um, they're providing MOOCs for us. Uh, we have MOOCs for every course in English and French. And uh, we have uh, the cost, uh, the residential cost is 8K euros, but we offer 50% of scholarships to any student participating in, the, uh, in our international network. It's today a master two, so that means students entering the master should uh, demonstrate they have a bachelor in four years or uh, the first year of a master program in computer science. And next year we open the bachelor and the master one. We have an international seminar on AI and big data. And then concerning EBR is a online version of the BR master degree, fully available in French and English. Sorry, excuse me. With a fully certified European degree that's called ECTS, European Credit Transfer System. It's 990 ECTS. The cost <clears throat> is 7 to 1,000 euros. And we can have a strong reduction, 30%, when we have a comp connected digital campus, as I said before, in the world, students there. And the Connect Digital Campus, do not forget, have a data lab, and that's enabled to have local um, partnerships with industry. And our ambition here is to build a dual degree. So students of the connected digital campus will get a local degree and the European degree. Sorry. Next. So with concerning the data lab in France, we sign a, a word agreement with Google. Wow. 
and first uh, experiment in the area of digital agriculture. Next. So the four skill set with BR correspond to the four jobs, data engineer, data scientist, big data developer, and cloud data architect. That's the four skills. And inside that we have, a, for the English version, nine academic course and four courses from Oracle University to bring the practical aspect online in the cloud in Oracle Cloud. So to summarize, we have we estimate we have four key differentiating features. The fact that the curriculum is built around four skill sets representing the four basic jobs in uh, AI engineering today with the data lab for students to get a practical uh, experience learning uh, by doing learning by project inside the curriculum. The strong international partnership well, today this webinar is a demonstration also with uh, uh, some operational uh, connect digital campus today. Strong professional involvement, Oracle for data management and cloud, Google for data analysis and cloud, so we have a formal agreement with them in order to um, enrich the theoretical aspect of the curriculum with practical courses. And then hybrid learning, we could go from 100% online to 100% face to face. And we can build with any partner this. So now we we'll focus on the micro credentials called Gradeos in Europe. The ambition is to get a certificate dual certificate, ECTS and uh, professional certificate corresponding to a given job. So that represents more or less uh, three, so that's a European framework that corresponds uh, more or less to three to six months of uh, education in terms of continuous education. Uh, the courses could for us come from the master program, the academic course, and we enrich with a professional or two professional courses. Next. So this corresponds to three or six ECTS, part of the master program and professional certification that could be useful in order also to understand um, what is the master program behind and the difficulty of getting it. So the three graduates with Oracle, Valerie will talk also about Oracle skill visions later. Um, is the first one is advanced SQL programming on, on data management um, using the SQL standard. And the professional course is SQL on Oracle Cloud uh, from Oracle. Big data and artificial intelligence. We have two courses from um, at the academic side for the big data and AI. The AI course comes from the University of Siena on machine learning and deep learning. And then we have a course on uh, Oracle Machine Learning on Oracle Cloud. And same with application development, full stack mobile web development. We have an academic course and then a course uh, on Oracle uh, to do that. Next, the graduate with Google um, is called AI in the Cloud. The focus here is AI. So we have also two academic courses. Uh, the two academic courses I talk uh, about from Marco Gori and Stefano Melacci from University of Siena, my course on big data, and then two courses from um, uh, Google, with, uh, which exist, by the way, on Coursera, and we should represent the, one of the Coursera, the most sold course on Coursera uh, last year uh, concerning AI in the cloud. And then some word on the CDC, because when we establish a formal partnership with the for an university, we create what we call the Connected Digital Campus, and it's a first important break towards this institute. We're thinking about the future, having a, a complete um, program, bachelor and master, with at every year um, formal uh, certi European certification with 50% of the course, which could be at least online. So the CDC representing a country, um, an e-learning third place, and what is important here is offering local tutoring. So students 
have the opportunity, online students have the opportunity to have a regular face to face tutoring with the uh, local professors. And that what that is for us uh, from our experience in e-learning, the most important point is tutoring. We offer remote tutoring, but there is also local tutoring within the CDC. And then the innovation lab. Local students work also on local projects with industry, and that's part of the tutors to be project managers of this project. For instance, I give you an example, an interesting example. There will be a free course in France we are building um, called um, a, a popularization MOOC on AI by example. So this um, MOOC will rely on six use cases will rely on six use case and we will have there uh, the opportunity to offer to every French student by January next year the capability of being um, uh, educated on AI based upon six concrete use cases they could redo. We did a privileged treatment to deep learning there, but that enables students to have projects in health, in marketing, in agriculture, in different fields in order to demonstrate the appeal of AI. And this could be done in any CDC on the planet we open. So the internationalization of CDC is a prime objective for us in Latin America, in Middle East, in the Gulf, in Africa and in Asia. So in Africa, we started signing formally in Africa. We signed here with AFRIA. AFRIA is a um, a French agency for Africa, French speaking countries in Africa. And with the president of Africa, we signed a formal agreement last year. And that concerns 33 countries in Africa. And we formally opened two CDC to connect a digital campus. The first one was in the Ivory Coast at ESATIC with Minister. And the second one was in Madagascar. So beginning this year in March and June, we did that. And we plan to open in many other countries. We are signing and we sign uh, uh, in 12 countries and, and we hope and we already sign with Silk Road Business School uh, for China. And um, and then we'll continue with Amrita University and with University of Danang and also uh, Etri in Korea. Next. So to, as a conclusion, I would say we are in front of uh, a new wave of education in which we like to play a key role. Um, we we'll call it adaptive learning. The fact that there will be customized learning tomorrow for every student on the planet with the uh, enrichment of online MOOC courses. So we have a PhD there and we are working in this field. We are even doing a research on the metaverse. We plan to open um, uh, next year uh, a version in the following years, but we opening uh, courses on the metaverse uh, end of this year. Next. So that's my last slide um, concerning experiential learning, and that's from our experience at University of Nice and at Estia. We know the importance in education and moreover in AI on practical, on projects. And we select innovation project in order to have on board uh, big companies like um, Google and Oracle, as you, as you see, but also small and startup company in the metaverse working with a French startup called Kinetics, a very successful one, providing avatars, etc. So from startups to local companies to big companies building the data lab and putting that um, project inside the curriculum. And that's our uh, key differentiator, what is needed by the market today and even for Gradio. So concerning uh, this, uh, as a conclusion, I would say the three major points I would like to address for BR, with, uh, which is still open, uh, and the EBR, of course, with the Gradio. Um, I would say we have and we provide uh, to partners this EBR master program in French and English, fully online. That could be 100% offline, and that could evolve to being 50% of local course and 50% of online courses when we have this dual degree agreement. Then the data lab, you understood now why it's centric to the education of EBR, both at Estia and in the connected digital campus. 
And then we offer to the market today four graduates for computer scientists, and we working with Oracle, for instance, to build a series of graduates. We may call it graduates by example in order to touch every sector of the economy. A gradio for agriculture, a gradio for marketing, a gradio for banking, etc. So that's part of. Uh, I would like to just to demonstrate that we create that dynamics and we're ready to share it in Asia with pleasure, as you will see in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. And now we will give the floor to Dr. Manisha. So, Dr. Manisha, you can unmute yourself. I will be more than glad to hear you. Good morning, everybody. Namaskar from India. Very happy to have you all part of this big initiative. Let me just try to share my present. Uh, some, uh, can someone uh, initiate the sharing of my slides? I yes. think it is disabled. Yes, just. Um... Unfortunately, uh, in the in the settings, we made that it couldn't be shared, so we don't have any disturbance, but we just. OK, now you should be able to present. Thank you. Perfect. Are you able to see my slide? Yes. So thank you, everybody. Uh, I will try to do it as fast as I could. So I would try to bring in the different research areas, the education and the, how applications are derived for a AI aspect and how it is actually providing solutions to the communities. That would be my major focus as I talk. I am Dr. Manisha and I'm the provost of the university looking at the research innovation in the disciplinary and internationalization. I'm very happy to be part of the Amrita University, whose official name is Amrita Vishya Vidya Pedam. The university as of today has eight campuses with different parts of the country with major disciplines from management, arts and humanities, social and behavioral sciences, engineering in all the branches, sciences, medicine, interdisciplinary on artificial intelligence, sustainable development, culture and spiritual studies, agricultural, etc. As of today, this university is ranked as top five in the country and what majorly recognizes or uh, shows how Amrita is dif uh, different is in the THE impact ranking of 2022, we are first in, in the country and 41st in the world, even though this university has started in the year 2003, which is less than 20 years in time. So, and we are able to make a really good mark in the areas of good health and well being, eight in the world, gender equality, eight in the world, clean water and sanitation, 15 in the world, and quality education, 32nd in the world. And uh, the university is, is considered as one among the institutions of eminence and with the top category of A NAC accreditation. What makes us different is the fundamental philosophy this university brings in from our chancellor. Uh, Sri Mata Amritanandamayi Devi, where we, we believe in education for life and education for living is needed with a focus on education for life, where the main purpose of education uh, ha should be to impart the culture of heart and with the enduring values and providing the enduring values and inner strength. So both our research and education looks into it. The major part we also look into it is the compassion driven research where we motivate our faculty and the students to do research to serve the lowest and most vulnerable strata of the society. By looking into what are the global challenges, then holding hands with both East and West from the, all the experts on all directions and try to bring out the global impact for the world. What made us to also think this is what we see is billions are at the bottom of the pyramid and the, there is a widening gap between science and technology, but the quality of life and environment are rapidly degrading. So the question is, how can we translate the 
advances to uplifting the villagers at the bottom of the pyramid and create a sustainable future for all. This is what our uh, chancellor has talked though in the UN United Nations Academic Impact uh, a Conference on Technological Solutions for Sustainable Development. I will read the last part. All universities should send their students to impoverished rural villages or city slums for at least one or two months for internship during their education. They would be able to see directly the issues and problems that the poor face. They could then develop solutions on everything they have studied and this would help us to help to help us to help the poor in the most effective way and at the same time awaken compassion in today's use. This made us to actually this made us to build this new program called Live in Labs, which is a multidisciplinary theory into practice program, which facilitates research development and deployment of sustainable solutions for the rural communities. So what does do is all of us actually learn in the classroom. We will listen and learn. We will do in the laboratory with exploring and experimenting, but we take one more step ahead to experiment in the village, thus embracing the culture in the village getting more insights into it, engaging with them. This helps us to innovate and build the sustainable solution and empowering the communities. The major grand challenges of the new millennium we are looking into are energy and environment, water and sanitation, health and hygiene, livelihood and skill development, education, and gender equality, waste management and infrastructure, agriculture and risk management. We know that to do this in the in a community scale, we have to go a long pathway to, tra to travel. And we have to actually see the challenges, what is existing and how the interrelationships are there. So that means it is bringing in a whole new paradigm shift is needed in the way we study, the way we do research to understand the interrelated, uh, interrelated factors which are leading to it. And at the same time, it will give you a new horizon of opportunities for us to work on. Thus, we are trying to bring in the experience of education for life, thus integrating AI for sustainable de uh, development in both research and education by giving them an experience, giving them an op opportunity to embrace the culture, the values, the system in the communities and engage them in individual or a group or a community phase and also empower ourselves, the community and the stakeholders. So during this work, we have seen a lot of challenges which we see naturally the climate change and is bringing in a lot of challenges and AI is trying to help us in that aspect. How do we do it? And we need to go deeper into different aspects of the ecosystem, look into the different systems, which are whether it is wireless or Internet of Things, etc. We can see that a large amount of glacial retreat, avalanches, melting is happening. So how do we understand the models? How do we simulate it? We need to monitor the forest and wetlands to see the ecosystem sustainability. We need to understand the precision, agriculture, irrigation, produce management. We also need to understand understand how our supply chain is affecting, how are the emissions happening, how is it is impacting the in, in our ecosystem, the urban planning and modeling and the future cities and optimization of the usage. How can we reduce the transport activity and bring in efficient mobility? How do we optimize the solar power generation so that we will use more of renewable energy and how can we come to know about the global warming and its prediction so that the climate modeling and prediction can be made more reliable and helpful to the community. So all these are needed to be done because of the large amount of degradation we are seeing in the ecosystem and which is leading to multi hazards which are taking into the into the state where we have the natural ecosystems have declined by 45, 47% percentage on an average and species have already faced extinction about 1 million. And the water degradation, if you see one in three people over the entire globe are already facing and natural disasters are occurring three times and the magnitude during the past 20 years, around 74 percentage of all natural disasters were water related. And there is a very large threat where the most direct is on the child survival. So all these are interrelated and they are integrating the climate change, the conflicts and ep epidemics, the institutions and governance, demographic and socio-cultural direct exploitation, land sea usage change. So this clearly tells us it's not enough to study one area. You need to have interdisciplinary and we need to see the, the engagement and the inherent relationships between these factors. So if you see that there is there can be different types of degradation 
And because of our unplanned daily activities, there are short term and extreme uh, long term um, effects and which will require us to track every action, impact on services, learn from dynamic behavior, initiate automatic corrective actions and track the impact of the interventions. Let us see how Amrita have gone through this process. Over the time on how can we monitor, detect and intervene in ecosystem degradation and bring in ecosystem system restoration where we have brought in a framework for monitoring and detection for technological intervention, governance interventions and implementation and restorations. And let me give an example with respect to what we have done with multi hazards with respect to looking into the how we develop the knowledge and measuring, monitoring, uh, threshold development, early warning, etc. and make a scalable and sustainable and resilient system which will give us all the different aspects we need. And as we do, we will see that when we do each of these areas are interrelated and it is it is very necessary for us to see the interrelationship to come into it. That's where AI plays a very big role for us to move forward. Let me look into climate disaster AI uh, uh, on sustainability. Here, if you see the Center for Wireless Networks and Applications at Amrita has worked on IoT for extreme environments, especially on landslide early warning systems, real time flood monitoring, offshore communication systems for fishermen and multi hazard and risk assessment with collaboration with National Research Council, British Geological Survey, UK Met Office and Geological Survey of India, King's College London and Newcastle University in US. So if you see, this is one of the image of landslides where you can see that there are multiple landslides happened here, but people are still living there under it and any landslide can be very imminent in a very short term. It will happen and the lives are lost. So what is happening just if you take landslides itself, there are different types of landslides and there is different variability in triggering parameters, thresholds, runoff spatial. But what is it becoming more dangerous is because of the extreme weather, increased level of unpredictability. This is making us to work on how we will find out the spatial impact and also temporal impact and how the cascaded impacts are. And this is this will need the knowledge of lead time we have to get enough lead time so that the information has to be, can be dis uh, disseminated and rescue the people and evacuation can be planned, which will require the dynamic risk assessment, which will save, save lives and community disaster resilience can be brought in. If we actually capture the triggers, which are of multi-dimensional from meteorological, geological, hydrological, so that it will capture the spatio-temporal variability and provide the effective risk management. So Amrita has developed the AI enabled IoT system for detection and early warning of landslides where 56,000 deaths per year due to landslides happen. Over 5,000 per lives impacted every year. And what we do is we sense beneath the earth deep layers of the earth and help get the data of different parameters then early one using AI ML approaches where it is able to warn either site specific or regional manner and it has active deployments in Western Ghats and Northeastern Himalayas and we have given early warnings from, from 2009 onwards even the latest 2022. We have deployment in Western Guards and Himalayas with more than 300 plus sensors, continuous real time monitoring, detection and early warning of landslides with more than three patents in this specific area of. However, the center has more than 20 plus patents. And has awarded as the World Center of Excellence for Landslide Disaster Reduction by International Program on Landslides. How it is? Uh, it is capturing all this. It will actually capture the multiple type of landslide provide the knowledge discovery and capacity development so that community scale resilience can be brought in by different aspects. So they will actually do the geoscientific work. They will do the resistivity work to understand the variability in resistivity. They will do geotechnical laboratory analysis. What you have to understand is these are different types of heterogeneous data which is coming into the system for us to analyze and and also the multi deeper prop which uh, which also bring in the multi layer heterogeneous sensing from different layers also will come in and this data all of this has to be collected in continuously where we have built a context aware energy aware node which will understand how the rainfall conditions how the climate variability is happening and accordingly it will decide which sensor has to be activated what data need to be collected based on the power availability so you understand there itself ai model is coming where it is it is trying to give the longevity for the iot node which is in the field and these 
data is sent into the wireless networks where we have multiple types of wireless networks has, has, has been integrated with Wi-Fi network, long range Wi-Fi, satellite network, broadband network. So it will analyze the context and understand which is the best one and then choose that networks to send the data to the to the field management center and also to the control center. So it is able to understand the climatic variations and the context and then do that. So that we will not lose the data and we will be able to give the warning always. And it will collect continuous rainfall, moisture, pore pressure, micro seismic data, movement data, etc. And it will then do all this into a heterogeneous IoT system is collecting all this data. It do the edge analytics and all along with that, we also collect data from crowdsource, remote sensing, hazard inventory, and it is fed into a decision support system, which has physical models and data driven models co combining together and then providing the early warning for the community level multi hazard modeling and even detection using the AI enabled IoT system architecture. And this is integrated with the IoT system with the comprehensive IoT framework and has a real-time visualization and data analysis system, which will give you in multiple levels in spatial and temporal scales. And it also helps us, these data of continuous more than a decade of data helps us to develop in the relationship of the multiple parameters. Here you can see how rainfall is varying and how the pore pressure which is inside the earth is varying and where the landslide is happening. And we are able to understand the spatial temporal variation and the seasonal variation of the of the mountain. And we are able to de uh, develop rainfall based specific threshold models for regional and parameter specific threshold models for site specific scenarios using AI enabled method where you can see that we have the, the thresholds both for the regional and site specific. Not only that, we have used this rainfall data to and the forecasted rainfall data of India Meteorological Division to find out what would be the pore pressure which is building at different layers of the soil. So I am able to understand almost seven days ahead what will be my pore pressure and then based on that how the mountain is going to fall or not, how its slope stability is going to affect. So we are able to give 24 hour ahead uh, prediction based on that. And not only that, we are able to also now cast data in case if I lose data because of any of the climatic conditions, my link is failing. So reliably, we are able to now cast the data and 24 hour ahead forecasting is happening. All this data is also used for actually mitigation of landslides and we integrated people into it and their knowledge has been also integrated and also we integrated the data from our laboratory setups, both movement based and landslide laboratory setup to understand and then this made us the Amrita landslide early warning system, which is a four level early warning system, where in first level it will uh, it will give the warning to the researchers, second level to the government, third to the media and public. After validating from field data, landslide laboratory and software. And we were able to give early warning at multiple times with, with based on the automatic decisions which is happening both e email, SMS and over etc. And we, we are able to give regional warnings and site specific warnings. And the system is integrated with all the different software systems required with service architecture, remote configuration, remote triggering and also capturing the data with the automatic cleaning, spatial temporal risk analysis, multi scale detection and of landslides, ML models, temporal disaster event detection, forecasting, fault tolerant communication, automatic warning models. And it is capable to cater to different spatial coverage, different reliability, etc. And these are some of the examples of early warnings we have given in 2020, and we, and we were able to give three warnings when there was a very heavy rainfall in Kerala, Kerala floods in 2018, and we were able to evacuate people and save lives based on these warnings. And these are some of the things, and this has helped in different ways. Let me now move on to medical and AI and sustainability. Here we work on the Center for Wireless Networks and Application work on uh, wearable systems, which is called Amrita Spandanam IoT ECG monitoring system, which is a context aware wearable system, which can be used at any time on you, and uh, you can still continue to do your routine work. And multi parameters from just a small device, five parameters continuously coming in, five in one device with the SpO2, heart rate, blood pressure, blood sugar, and, uh, and breathing rate. We also have a blood cancer detection system using thermograms and histopathology, and we have used these solutions during the COVID time for remote patient monitoring. 
and we work very closely with Amrita Hospitals, which has almost uh, 2,600 bed in the Faridabad Delhi campus and 1,400 bed in Kochi campus, where we work with the doctors very closely in AI and genes. You can see histo cancer for leveraging AI to help pathologists. Fatal condition seconds like predicting patients deterioration, medical simulation, pharma AI, neurology and AI, AI for molecular discovery, cancer early onset of signs, edge AI for wearables, speed bug AI and AMR, nutrition and nudging and mental health and AI. Due to time constraint, I'm not going into details, but we also have worked on clinical support systems for cardiology, neurology and sleep study, oncology, COVID-19 and rehabilitation. And for cancer detection research, as I said, using deep learning of convolutional neural network and automated histopathology slide and early detection of breast cancer using thermographic imaging and ML models. And as I said that, you know, using this small device, we are able to actually predict five, five different uh, data with blood pressure, acute, acute hypotensive episode, sleep apnea, sepsis prediction. So different models has been developed based on the AI and ML approaches. And we made the ECG device as a context of our device, and it is able to actually do the analysis even when you are doing a TMT, your exercise, your regular work, etc. So that the real health of the heart can be monitored and the actions can be taken by the doctors. All of this has been has been connected into a, a mobile application and also web application with multi-parameter vital monitoring system with a dashboard integrated into for step-down care, home and care house patient monitoring. And more than 1,000 patients has been already tested and used and visualizing the vitals and early warning score is integrated and used for COVID-19 patients. And we also using all these things, we have built a remote ICU bedside monitoring deployed in 14 40 bed in COVID-19 facility in Kochi and a low cost remote IoT bedside monitor and has been built. Now let me move into skill development, robotics, AI and sustainability. As you see that 41.6 percentage of the population of India live below the poverty line. And if you see that 900 million Indians to be skilled by 2030 and employment opportunities are mainly in informal sector. So what we want is we are looking into the vocational education part, but the training infrastructure we have to bring it up. There are a lot of cultural issues to be handled because women are, are disadvantaged in skill development. This is done by Amachi Labs who and all the UNESCO chair on women's empowerment and gender equality team. And they will they have actually looked into different areas and there is uh, Amachi Lab and the Hut Lab at the university looks into robotics research at Amrita, where during the COVID period, Hut Lab has worked on Annapurna, a, fr a food and drug delivery teleoperated robot, autonomous wheelchair with negative pressure isolation hood, low cost UV sanitation robot Prabha and Amar and an unmanned robotic coconut climber. And, and Amachi Labs have worked on skill training simulators, haptics plus AI plus virtual VR. They have actually HRI in the wild, a water carrying robot, social robots or behavioral change, especially Hatshi. They train hand washing behavior in the rural communities and also remotely controlled robotic um, articulator for neuro inspired control algorithms. So in, re in redefining skill development, they are building, they are looking into all the areas and they are looking into building aspiration, teaching physical skills, using cutting edge technologies, targeting women and marginalized rural communities. And some of their major outputs are they have come up with a very uh, pedagogically effective haptic system for tool handling for training of vocations. More than 6,000 women has been trained using these devices. Each device has have more than and 20, 20 skill set can be trained through, through that and it and uh, and and it is able to and it is able to change the different types of materials, different types of, uh, you know, whether it is plumbing, whether it is electrician work. Accordingly, training modules can be trained and based on the person skill set, it just moves on automatically. So the whole AI is inbuilt into it, and they have built in in such a manner there is an e-learning course materials and course components and final training. So first they will have the computer simulation based training integrated with haptics and then the field training. And each of these modules are interconnected and interrelation is taken up so that the student's learning capacity is also looked into it and thus an adaptive module is brought in. 
and you can see that how they are learning the plumbing, how they are after learning the plumbing work. They even have these women have built more than 200 toilets in the country to actually take care of the sanitation in the country. And they also from this, they also have come up with an output for uh, as building a custom haptic simulator for construction trade, rebar bending skill training, which is used to buy India's largest infrastructure company, Larson and Turbo, for training their, their uh, staff in the machine department. It is a multi-model simulation environment with visual, audio and haptic feedback for construction, rebar bending skill training for the people. And they look for different areas for designing sustainability, productivity, cost systems, approach and inclusivity. What they have seen is like there is an imbalance and bias training data set when they try to do it in looking into the inclusivity and aspect. They reflects and amplifies the gender stereotypes and generalization leads to oversimplification, which reinforces gender roles. So this became a challenges in adoption. They proposed a methodology and framework called OVSM to develop and validate methodological framework for late years. So you see that how they have brought in the empowerment of a state from individual to household community by integrating their their access, their awareness opportunities and building the mental mental space. And then from there, they have looked into social, cultural. They have looked into safety and security, health, education, economic and empowerment. And by taking the technical domains of spatial temporal analysis, exploratory experiment design, natural language processing, fuzzy models, analytical social networks and simulation modeling and decision support. However, they are also aware that all these things also have to be integrated in such a manner that when we are increasing the efficiency in the use of resource leads to a falling cost that leads to a greater consumption of the resource, which is not good for ecosystem restoration. So how your AI models can be used in such a manner that this is balanced. So in all their work, they were looking into that. Now let me move into energy, water and AI sustainability. Here we have worked on, on a European Commission fund, funded FP7 project under called Stabilize for smart grid distribution network, micro hydro and solar power, smart grid lab and water wise communities. And with respect to and we also worked on 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 building uh, IoT system for four um, water distribution systems in four secondary cities in the country in Mumbai, in West Bengal, uh, in Punjab, and and in Kerala. There are four parts of the country, and uh, we also worked on majorly on building the India's first remote on the education side on first remote triggered lab in wireless sensor network and bringing in immersive learning as a global gateway classroom and AR based heritage based reconstruction. In each one of them, when you want to reconstruct the heritage, you have to learn their parameters through image processing and other sensor based technologies. And this heterogeneous data has to be connected and AI based approach has to be learned for the short term and long term effects for reconstruction. Same way in the global classroom also immersive learning. Each student is different. Each topic is different. So how do you take care of these things? Then education and AI in sustainability working with Am Amrita Create and School of Computing. They, they have a very large group working on AI and disability studies where they look into mental disability, learning disability, speech impairment and vision impairment. And they look into major projects. They look into sign language accessibility to e-governance services, a multi-dimensional framework for reading and spelling acquisition, screening of readability difficulties, screening of autism. They also have a large work on online laboratories for school children and an a and a digital learning ecosystem for children and wearable assistive device for blind and visually impaired. And they also work on computational linguistics on Indic studies, Indic languages and computational museology with a automatic code transformation tools for automatic annotation, multilingual, multi-domain NMT for low resource, etc. And also English and Indic languages. And they also work on data science and modeling for social good, where they look into predictive modeling, regular use of intelligent tutoring system, optimization of relief distributions, factors influencing and improving students' performance, and the network analysis, optimization of sustainable agriculture and operations research. Another major impact they have brought in is the medical simulation, virtual patient case for the students who are studying as a medical doctor. And uh, they, which is implemented for designed for the medic MBBS students, where they visualize, learn, practice, and experience. And AI-based differential diagnosis module for clinical data has been built in. And collaborative robotics is another work which they are doing to help elderly people, and also the development of a self-learning software product 
prototype for human interaction using AI. And AI for AI disability, they actually work uh, with respect to uh, Indian, as I said, Indian sign language and a scalable approach for maximize coverage in diverse indoor and outdoor multi-camera system. And these are the other works which they have they have worked on, and they work on drug uh, drug interactions, drug to drug interactions on uh, ontology driven knowledge based systems for disease and treatment. There is a large group working on AI in cyber security. They work on decision centric approach for secure and energy efficient cyber physical systems, game theoretic approach to trustworthiness of cyber physical systems, bio inspired approach to secure network control, identify the identity based security framework for smart cities, multi plane security framework, SDN, FV based threat monitoring and deep learning approaches for intelligent intrusion detection. All these uh, has been brought into the education sector at Amrita, where for the next generation AI innovators, we have brought in an undergraduate program in AI, which is running in the four campuses as an engineering sil syllabus for four years. We're combining computer science and engineering foundation with mathematics and domain knowledge and working in the social systems, in the communities. All the students get the opportunity to work in the communities as part of living labs programs work on different challenges in those communities and then take forward and also we have postgraduate and doctoral programs with specialization in ai with first year in research thesis track and industry internship every master's students publish their work in scope in conference or journals and doctoral programs in interdisciplinary fields employing ai in their own domains to solve some of the most challenging problems and we have specifically we have launched an interdisciplinary school under which we have a school for sustainable development where um, uh, Amrita's Chancellor Amma has actually initiated E4 Life Scholarship. 100 students per year are given scholarship of dollar 5.1 million per year is, has been put across for that. And that is helping us to actually build the AI uh, solutions. A division of AI has been built and the students work under this division with the with this school in the communities to build solutions for the uh, existing global challenges in these rural communities. So they will actually focus on experiential and immerse. They, they will get the focus on experiential and immersive learning, enriching the multidimensional course curriculums and drive by student community are there because there are almost 80 percentage of the students in this are are international students and they work on multidisciplinary thing. Their doctoral committee itself has multidisciplinary people from different campuses, from different schools and from also at least one international faculty coming in. So it is very, very intensive and very thought provoked way they have actually designed the whole thing to provide the experience and to build the best solution for the community. And all this has helped us to through live in labs. All these programs, educational programs has helped has helped us to make a pan India footprint in each of the area, energy and environment, water and sanitation, health and hygiene, livelihood and skill development, education, and gender equality, waste management and infrastructure, agriculture and risk management with more than 2000 students going into the communities every year working on these problems. And these are the villages where they have already contributed with providing solutions. And this has enhanced our capabilities and brought in recognitions and also helped us to bring in networks by having UNESCO chair on experiential learning for sustainable development, innovation and development, UNESCO chair in gender equality and women's empowerment and tribal center of excellence from the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. What made us all to do all these things and what is the basis for what we are doing is the words from our chancellor. If we could transform compassion from a mere word into a path of action, we would be able to solve 90% of, of world's humanitarian problems. This is the basis for the universities. This is the basis in which our research and education is built in. And in that AI is one of the fundamental thing which is bringing in the interdisciplinary actions and taking forward the automated in decisions, which is helping the poor in the world. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, very Dr. Much, Dr. Himanisha. Himanisha. Uh, could you uh, please, please uh, stop the sharing of your screen, please, so I can okay. share mine? Yep. We'll be Perfect, thank you. We will be able to continue. So, Dr. Shiam, now I give you the floor. Um, thank you so much. I'm just going to add to what uh, previous speakers, Professor Serge Miranda and Dr. Manisha, Professor Manisha, just explained. We've been doing a lot of different things, diverse things at Amrita. And one of the th one of the core passions being that all of us here are connected by our interest for applied AI. Uh, I'm going to talk, my talk is going to be much, much smaller. I'm going to talk about the applied AI in health, 
especially with the focus that some of the topics that Dr. Professor Manisha already addressed, I'll skip. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. So we do a lot of different stuff. When I talk about AI, most of you, uh, at least the group here, are familiar that we are talking about certain focus areas. So in Atamrita, we focus on methods and applications. Methods, we talk about people like computer scientists or uh, life science uh, with applied uh, computing degrees, working on conventional methods, machine learning um, in today's world, deep learning or as well, a little bit of other standard AI approach and specifically of interest to me is what is called neuro-inspired AI as well, where we take lessons from neuroscience and we apply to reconstruct what evolution has done for centuries into our millennials into what we call as computational algorithms. Typically, if you look at that, I've seen co several colleagues of mine work on topology or let's say computational topology, measurement studies, e-governance or governance, impact studies, app development, embedded AI or embedded techniques, internet of things that what uh, my colleague just mentioned about a lot of such examples and pervasive computing. This is the exam these are the platforms with which uh, strategies with which we work on AI for healthcare, for example, AI in healthcare. And if you look at several universities across India and probably many uh, in universities in this area, you see applied AI scientists have been using a box of these techniques, a bunch of these techniques working in domains that are pertinent to today's work. And can I have the next slide, please? Specifically, in today's uh, short talk, I'm going to talk about AI in healthcare. I'm talking about where uh, uh, not just Amrita, but also many universities in India, many places across the globe are focusing on. If you look at Amrita picture, we look at healthcare system analysis as a primary AI uh, phenomenon. We talk about neuro, uh, neuro AI in treatment design. We look at digital consultation especially hospital management systems or hospital information systems. Uh, and um, if you, since we develop our own HIS, hospital information systems, we have a lot of this pertinent to digital consultation where natural language processing and other techniques come in. We're talking today uh, as we are scaling up to have the largest private hospital in India, which was launched on October 20, uh, August 24th, uh, a week ago by our prime minister. We're talking about care providers as a critical infrastructure and integrating them with AI-based AI methods. Uh, drug and lead, Dr. Manisha just presented a case study where we're looking at drug-drug interactions, drug-drug ontology studies, uh, systems biology. For example, I'm looking at Parkinson's and Alzheimer's as um, uh, onset and progression phenomena using systems biology as AI story. We are looking at precision medicine and some of these examples. And I, I would like to pull an example that it's not just us, it's the entire world. I think many of us here would talk about uh, AI as an intervention in today's medicine, today's healthcare. I'm specifically talking about neuro AI. I'm reminded of Lily Peng of Google talking about that the phenomena that people are other domain experts like neurologists are scared with. Nobody today, everybody today, especially after the COVID knows something that we were scared about, let's say 10 years ago. We know AI is not going to replace doctors. It's only going to aid people. And this is where Amrita's focus is also in. Next, please. Next slide. Um, I'm going to give you very few case examples. I'm talking about a colleague of mine, a very closely working collaborator who runs, who, uh, who heads uh, our Center for Epilepsy. So one of the few, some of the few examples that has happened in the last four or five years, is uh, we have developed, a, the team has developed an expert system for brachial plexus lesions, typically a scenario where the nerves conducting information from your shoulder or arm gets uh, has problems communicating that to the central nervous system or the uh, brain, for example. Uh, last year we published, that was a work along with us at uh, MindBrain Center, we've been working on uh, automating the way we can uh, identify epilepsy zones in the brain using AI techniques. The colleague of mine, a stu previous student of mine, was the first author. He developed a technique where quantified epilepsy as a structure and started ranking them and identifying automated methods for better neurosurgical interventions in epilepsy conditions. The center, the Amrita Advanced Center for Epilepsy also works on PET, PET, 
positive animation tomography asymmetry index for epilepsy and these techniques are very very expensive let me give you a simple example on an average professor sibi or dr sibi uh, the consultant neurologist for epilepsy handles 60 to 70 cases of epilepsy patients a day with um, the standard minimum typically in india being 20 to 25 patients per day outpatient cases if you look at out and inpatient at the number of 60 or 70 for a neurologist uh, for an expert neurologist AI is the only solution. In fact, that's one thing that we are looking at for facilitating clinicians to reduce their workload. So this is decision support for uh, asymmetry index in epilepsy is a, is a critical story that we're working on. We are also looking at hippocampal volumetry when we do MRI scans. We want to look at changes in volumetry across different parts of the brain. Activation when we do fMRI studies. We are looking at these kind of volumetry studies in epilepsy. Next, please. Um, another colleague of mine, typically Professor uh, Dr. Sri and N.R. Sri Hari, has been working on endovascular phenomena for aneurysms. Aneurysms, brain aneurysms, are very, very critical. And a lot of doctors spend time losing, uh, making decisions related to the kind of therapeutic interventions, the kind of devices that are needed to remove these aneurysms. So we started looking at uh, a 3D reconstruction, AI driven 3D reconstruction for anterior computation communicating artery aneurysms and uh, these are not just uh, for uh, st uh, standard approaches can be done for a lot of other studies as well if you look at our pediatric neurologists and other phenomena they've been looking at uh, 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 neurology in terms of early stroke detection early stroke is very very critical and we've been um, asking a lot of uh, critical questions on what kind of early stroke detection techniques can be used and one of the things that has worked out with our computer science group, Professor Vivek Man and a colleague of mine who also is part of uh, the PhD of our big network of integrating our PhD students, uh, Dr. Vivek and his group has worked with Pro Dr. Vivek Nambiar, who's a neurologist, and they've been using, let's say, ImageNet uh, for analyzing early stroke detection using t CT scans. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So a uh, big picture shot, if you look at our mind brain center, I've never covered it. We will be using the same techniques. We are not just developing techniques for solutions, but we are also developing a uh, picture. I, re I, I remember Dr. Manisha showed about robotics in uh, at Amrita. One of the things that we are working on is how does the brain, how do you use the brain's architecture to control robotic arms? And we are looking at neuro AI methods to, con uh, to understand a low cost prosthesis. So today, if you look at AI, whether it's a gait detection, whether it is uh, diseases, whether it's analysis of images, whether it's reconstructing brain architecture using biophysically detailed models of neurons, today we use this for a lot of things. So if you look at Amrita and in general India, I would, on, I would say uh, over the last three to four years, AI is becoming popular for several domains. One, in healthcare, we are talking about imaging. Um, in fact, at our new hospital, we have all the imaging in one unit and a computing right next, to, right opposite to it is a computing wing. So you will see that a lot of things that will be driven in the next generation, especially clinician decision support, will rely on AI and imaging. The other one is surgery. Already there is a, a colleague of mine working on who has been doing several surgeries using robotic uh, systems, the uh, Rosa robots and the Da Vinci robot at our hospitals, robotic driven neurosurgeries are becoming very, very critical. One of the things that you will also look at is AI is not just going to tell how to perform the surgery, where to move in the surgery, but also the choice of which equipment that you need to perform when during when you perform such a uh, time consuming or probably even uh, human uh, mental consuming mentality consuming tasks that require several clinicians to work together. And specifically, I would say AI is becoming critical for clinicians to answer the question of device selection, especially to reduce cost in scenarios like in Asia, for example, especially South Asia, uh, South and Southeast Asia. And uh, one, once you start working on this, you understand AI in, in medicine is also a shortcut for applications. But along with a shortcut, when you look at AI in medicine as a path, we realize that as a, a group that works on mind brain sciences, we, we see the following challenges. The challenges one is data. 
mental health data is not easily AI solvable. Some aspects of it, yes, but context dependency is very, very critical. This is where we work with Trento, for example, University of Trento in Italy, for looking at diversity aware context sensitive data systems uh, as an AI driven phenomena. The second thing is validation. Typically, if you look at AI in medicine, the one of the challenges in AI education is AI education teaches you how to apply an AI technique, but when it comes to validation, it becomes a big challenge. And thereby, we are talking about human in the loop AI, and human in the loop AI is what hospitals are going to look at. And you saw an example that Professor Manisha already presented on. She has a very beautiful uh, ECG slash uh, medical signal system that is a great example of how she and uh, her group are engaging human in the loop AI. And one of the challenges that we see with AI is privacy. Um, GDPR is one of the primary things that is changing the dimensionality of AI applications in the world. Even though it's European driven, if you look at Eurocentric designs of these problems, so, uh, solutions, you have to look at privacy. So AI and privacy is becoming a huge factor in building these models and these systems. And finally, uh, I'm very happy to have followed Dr. Manisha in her talk because there's a lot of things that you understand that adaptability is a big picture. The four pictures that I've placed in my slide are, are not mine, but from examples that American colleagues have been doing for building robotic arms, or medical diagnostics, or brain scans, or di disease diagnostics, where we realize that uh, AI does not teach much about how interdisciplinarity and adaptability has to be in, inbred or in, inbuilt into these problems. And this is something that uh, we are trying to incorporate into our AI education. We have uh, started BTEC bachelors in technology programs in AI with computer science generic phenomena where the techniques of adaptability are very critical. When you look at master's education, we talk about validation and human in the loop and app development and uh, solution development. So you actually work with a group of um, very diverse thinking people who may not may or may not work with it. When you look at PhD sciences, we have everything. In, in addition to it, we also build sustainability and that's, uh, um, that's our biggest, one of our biggest challenges that we are looking at when you look at uh, uh, interdisciplinarity in terms of these problems. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Shiam, for, for this presentation. So now we will have the pleasure to listen to the engineer Debbie Prasad Pati from Data Consulting Services. So Debbie, if you can please unmute yourself. Perfect. So uh, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, we, we can hear you perfectly. OK, th thank you uh, for inviting me uh, for this, uh, you know, sessions and a uh, lot of thanks to professor and you uh, you know I, I was not sure actually whether i could make it for this uh, you know session yeah but i know i know and, <laughs> and thank you so much for taking the time i i know your situation so thank you very much so uh, it, it, you know what i understand and i wanted to convey here you know why actually somebody would go after AI today? I'll start from there itself. You know, if you have data, then you can apply AI and you can bring insights. That is the basic fundamental on which, you know, we industry is talking about AI and we are also talking about AI and researchers actually they are talking about AI. And uh, my previous, uh, you know, presenter, starting from Professor Sarge, he nicely presented what we should focus to build that skill. What actually, you know, universities offering actually to reach there. And then uh, Dr. Manisha and uh, Sham, they spoke about how it is helping, you know, what is the inherent issues in the niche area, how it is helping. So it was a very nice, uh, you know, session indeed. And uh, being part of Agri Tata Consultancy Services, you know, I've been associated with, uh, you know, various projects. 
delivery till now you know more than actually you know 25 years and we have seen actually how that it systems actually that is evolved and what is today if i if i analyze actually from that perspective you know 20 years back each and every industry they were talking about one small one thing how to you know enable it such that their record keeping exercises will be done then actually subsequently they bring up the processes how to optimize the process business processes then actually they started thinking when actually the mobiles and other actually you know devices actually that would come into picture which is having computing power they thought that how to execute the services actually outside the enterprise and today they are thinking beyond and that is the reason you know you could see we are having actually iot ai digital twins all these actually you know concepts technology they are put together and uh, we can achieve actually lot of things you know which was not possible actually earlier in the process you know we have brought actually another big problem that problem is you know that increases the attack surface of the systems actually which are built on it and related technologies and protecting actually those it uh, you know systems is paramount and very uh, you know very important aspects that is the reason you will find up the last 6 uh, 7 years all the countries they started actually you know analyzing and they started actually you know defining what are critical infrastructures they are having in us actually they have defined 16 critical infrastructures which i put it across and uh, you know in other countries like australia canada actually they also define what are critical infrastructures actually you know they wanted to focus so some of them actually they are having 11 some of them actually it's 11 uh, you know 13 so it is it depends upon actually what kind of actually operations actually they would uh, you know see that actually they are critical uh, critical for their uh, you know countries and uh, what should be the strategy what should be the policy and how to protect them so those aspects actually are getting defined moving to the next slide now i wanted to you know say actually some of the trends as i said actually the journey till so far you know each and every uh, each and every actually critical infrastructures they are undergoing digital transformation you know some of the actually critical infrastructures actually they were running with you know industrial control systems and uh, other it systems now they are moving to 4.0 if i am talking about a please airport you know right now actually we are at uh, smart airport 4.0 earlier it was actually 3.0 so everybody has defined actually sudden steps and each and every cio actually they are also thinking that digital digital transformation is the journey actually they have to take and they wanted to stay relevant for that and uh, and another thing also that is actually uh, you know very important that is conditional monitoring then predictive maintenance you know digital twins and uh, you know because there are huge logistics involved so everybody is talking about that uh, they could see the complete visibility of their supply chain so these are the aspects of they are uh, you know thinking to improve from the all critical infrastructure perspective and at the same time actually uh, safety security and safeguarding the system actually is uh, you know paramount so they, this is the trend actually we are having actually today and uh, of course actually trend is they are and that would be addressed by the technology which are available actually uh, you know uh, so now coming back to smart city i'll just give actually two examples i i i, I didn't bring up because of time constraint actually i don't bring up you know more examples uh, you know in, in smart cities today you'll find if you see the left hand side there are so many services actually that is getting offered 
it is not a single IT system actually which is running there itself. You know, you have actually multiple IT systems running and they are interconnected and uh, citizen are accessing. So, so, so it is a complete actually interconnected IT systems actually which is operational in nature today. And uh, you know, any malicious intentions of any actors, it would disrupt actually, you know, any systems there itself. And that I, 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 I couldn't imagine if our railway reservation system would stop actually for 24 hours, how do we survive actually in India? If our, I, you know, um, power grid actually goes down for eight hours or for three, four hours in any of the, you know, cities, how do we survive? So considering actually those facts, you know, it is very important actually to protect actually, you know, those critical, you know, uh, infrastructure. So smart cities, we have multiple critical infrastructures actually which are interconnected and uh, providing services today to us. So uh, moving to the next, the same same way actually, you know, I picked actually smart airports. It's a different scenario, you know. Uh, slowly, slowly, actually, uh, you know, what happens? A lot of people, uh, you know, they travel and avail actually, you know, airports. And uh, and uh, because of actually a lot of malicious, actually, uh, you know, intentions and terrorist attacks. So these actually installations are very critical today. And uh, there are different people, actually, they come. You know, it is not that actually only, uh, you know, contractually agreed people, they go there and operate. So you'll find actually, you know, passengers are coming, airport staffs, contractors. So a lot of actually, uh, you know, associates actually, they come and work. Similarly, actually, it provides actually not only uh, airport operations as a service, but there are a lot of other services actually which are there. So it becomes a very critical, uh, you know, system actually today. So I'm, I just picked up these two, uh, you know, examples just to uh, think that actually the complexity of those critical infrastructure. And if you consider any plants and other things, they're very, uh, you know, uh, very large, very complex. You know, the systems are actually not, uh, you know, only based on IT. There are industrial control systems which are provided by uh, various, uh, uh, you know, vendors and they work together and there are a lot of legacy systems actually that is also prevailing there itself. And uh, when actually it was operationalized, that time actually nobody was thinking about how to protect those, you know, uh, devices and uh, uh, applications. Similarly, actually there is no pure play, actually authentication mechanism in place. So there are actually various, uh, you know, issues that is prevailing there itself. Now, what are the challenges actually we are facing today? There are different challenges actually in the critical infrastructures because actually everybody wants to have digital transformation journey. And we have integration issue. We have actually standards issues. We, we envision a lot of actually business process improvement, but it's not easy to implement. And there are a lot of technologies, uh, you know, that is there. But you can't actually say that uh, all these technologies are sustainable in nature. You know, when you deploy any IoT systems, as uh, uh, you know, Dr. Manisha pointed out, actually they are putting sensors actually in the, you know, um, uh, in, in Himalayan range and other things. You know, sustainability is a very important factor. You know, how to sustain because data collection, if it fails, actually, you can't actually run your AI models actually to, you know, provide the right uh, decision. So, so based on all these factors, cybersecurity is a, another actually big challenge. So, so that is what I wanted to highlight because as we are thinking actually the positive thing, but inherently we are bringing a negative things there itself, which is which requires actually more attention from the cybersecurity perspective. So moving to the next slide. So, you know, I'll just give a glance of, uh, you know, what is happening. 
see, you know, there are actually healthcare breach, you know, that has happened actually in Mexico and uh, uh, 62,000, uh, you know, residents are affected. Similarly, uh, you know, uh, other places actually, you know, a lot of incident happened. Similarly, actually, you, you, you uh, understand actually if something goes, uh, you know, there is a war like actually situation in different parts and uh, people, if people don't focus on actually their nuclear installations, if somebody would access and, uh, uh, you know, do certain actually disruptive activities, then nobody knows actually what is going to happen because the focus is different right now, uh, you know, because of war. So, so anything can happen actually from that perspective. That is the reason I just bring actually, you know, why it is important. So uh, moving to the next. So one, another important aspect because we all are talking about AI and uh, the basic uh, skill actually what we are going to have, we understand code. You know, we want to understand actually programming. Based on that, actually, we build actually our carrier or build actually, uh, you know, services which would uh, solve actually real, you know, problems of industries and, uh, uh, you know, any, uh, you know, government or any, uh, you know, operational things. But we need to understand one thing that 69 percent is actually that is the findings we are having, you know, 70 around 70 percent is of actually code is open source. You know, nobody owns actually it. So, 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 you know, it is not actually nobody owns it. You know, if there is a vulnerability, nobody knows. You know, you can't actually uh, say that actually you are responsible for that. And similarly, there are other issues which are there. And uh, um, that is what actually, uh, you know, the Jaguar Land Rover actually CEO says. You see actually, you know, what is the reality? And that is applicable for other industries also. So that is the reason actually I put this slide just to put an emphasis that whatever we are making, inherently we are actually bringing a lot of vulnerability which you, that is not our intention, but it is still there. So that is the reason we have to ensure that actually it should not create a problem, you know, when activity is operational. Moving to the next slide. So, so as I talked about actually, you know, uh, how to prevent actually critical infrastructures. And uh, first thing is that, there are actually, you know, various ways actually we can protect the, uh, you know, critical infrastructures. And uh, there are various techniques actually that is there. But there are two basic things. One is, we wanted to know actually what has happened. When something has happened, we wanted to know exactly actually at the point of speaking, how it happened. Who is there? What is the risk? How to mitigate? These are the three basic questions actually we need to ask each and every time. If I delay this thing, if I delay actually 30 minutes or actually, you know, which is not actually acceptable for person actually who is responsible for critical infrastructure to run. So, so, so that is very important. Now, now the question is that why is the concept of continuous authentication? You know, typically whatever we are doing today, I'm accessing, uh, you know, my laptop. You know, I'm just actually providing my credential. It could be, you know, my uh, identity and uh, then uh, my password. And I can go for actually multi-factor authentication. So that is a discrete authentication. I'm not, you know, once I access, then I can roam around. I can go to anywhere, you know, uh, till it uh, locks down. But it is not continuously. It is not checking me where I am. So, so the discrete authentication scenario does not 
give my adequate situational awareness, which is very important. So that is very important actually aspect, which is, uh, you know, the the uh, the community has understood that. If you wanted to protect, this is one thing actually we have to focus for critical infrastructures. And similarly, the uh, risk and mitigation, you know. Now, what is the risk? Can I, how do I have actually tools, utilities, AI models to run, to check? Is there any vulnerability? How do I, uh, how do I actually, how do I, you know, um, make it run there itself? So, it's not easy for critical infrastructures. If I'm having an IT system, which is running in a data center, it's easy because it is very standard. It's very mature. We we have ugly servers. We put the security tools and it runs it. But that is not the scenario if you go to the plant. So for that, you need a test bed. So that is the reason, you know, you will come across. You know, the need of test bed. Which would host, you know, those uh, security tools, AI models which would discovers your vulnerability. And at the same time, actually, it would apply the patch and prevent it. Now, the question is that why, why that uh, test bed is required for a critical infrastructure? Because the majority part of the critical infrastructures, you know, you'll find actually hardware oriented. And uh, the software which runs there itself, it is depending upon hardware. It is coming from various vendors. And there are a lot, lot of legacy systems are there. They generate data which is not in a standard format. So you have to collect a lot of data from various systems, actually in the Indian industrial control systems. That is the reason actually the test bed is required there itself. And such that you can collect those data. Once you collect the data, then you can do the analytics and check the vulnerability and apply the patch. So that is that is what actually I wanted to bring actually as uh, you know two important things actually uh, you know uh, for critical infrastructures besides actually other things because we we ensure that actually uh, you know proper preventive measure at the perimeter side then endpoint side all the things actually we you know do. So so understanding that aspects actually I personally also involved actually as part of TCS in two you know research activities at CSCRC Australia. So one one actually we uh, you know as I talked about actually continuous authentication. Both the both the scenario actually we applied actually to airport smart airport because we created the consortium actually to focus on that because unless you have the consortium it's not easy. So, sorry, Didi, could, you, to, could you please conclude? Because we have yes. uh, very, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we can, you know, I'll give me 30 seconds, I'll conclude that one. Moving to the next slide. So, so yeah, we can share actually the slide, you know, what I talked about, I explained. So, so, you know, then you'll come to know actually uh, what we have done actually for building a test bed for smart airport. Similarly, if you move to the next slide. This is for continuous authentication system. You know what we are going to have. We have actually different systems and we can collect uh, you know data. If you have access control system, you have actually RFID system to track people. You have actually Wi-Fi system to get access. So you are collecting all ambi uh, ambience data and along with actually whatever systems you are having discrete data, we can create a AI model. That is what actually we are doing, you know, for continuous authentication system. Moving to the next slide. So here actually, you know, you can have uh, other areas where you can focus that I just list down. If you get a chance to go through uh, based on actually, you know, students interest, actually they can you know, start focusing. So that's all actually. Thank you very much. That's all actually from my side.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Devi. So now we will have the pleasure to listen to Dr. Myung Jun Kim. So please, Professor, if you can unmute yourself. It's nice. It's perfect. To see you. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's so nice to see you in this web seminar. Yeah. Uh, let me let me uh, count down the time. Excuse me. Okay, let's go start. Yeah, I prepared uh, this presentation with five slides. That was asked by the organizer, Madame Misket Bon uh, Hamida. Yeah. Yes. Thank so, you. <laughs> <laughs> so it will take uh, about only ten minutes. Yeah, you can expect that. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Thank yeah. you. Okay, okay. Let me let me tell you about the, the AI talent development policies and the current state of AI education in Korea. The the Korean government announced national strategy for artificial intelligence in December, December 2019. Yeah, uh, which was jointly developed by the all ministry, around 10 ministry, uh, including the Ministry of Science and ICT, Information and Communication Technology. According to the national strategy, the government established its plan to force the AI talent with, with the AI application development and uh, utilization capabilities that can lead the, the fourth industrial revolution. The AI development policies include establishing AI education programs for all citizens and fostering AI experts, such as uh, expanding the high, highest level of masters and the doctoral level of AI education and the research program programs within the universities and uh, expanding the software and uh, AI learning opportunities to reinforce the, the computational thinking of elementary, middle and high school students. Next, please. Yes. Uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, <clears throat> the Ministry of Education has chosen AI as an important education policy task in consideration of the recent digital technology advancement accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Under the, uh, under the policy plan, Government will nurture 100,000 AI and software experts by the year 2025 and promote AI basic literacy education for all citizens. In 2021, the government developed the AI education content criteria for each class of elementary, middle, and high school promoting AI related courses using supplementary teaching materials. In order to strengthen the teacher's AI related competencies, AI related content is included in basic and computer teaching courses. Now, now, I will tell you about the, the AI Academy program for employees promoted, promoted by ETRI, our institute. As, I, as AI technology becomes more important, the demand for AI talent is increasing. However, there is a shortage of AI talent around the world, and it is difficult to secure it. The private sectors and government in Korea are making an effort to cultivate AI talent. So 
Atri has proposed nurturing AI professionals as a Atri AI strategy to meet both internal and national demand for AI talent. Atri opened the AI Academy in July 2020. The purpose of uh, AI Academy is to promote employee, employees' achievement and uh, preparation for global competitiveness by nurturing AI experts, such as strengthening the core R&D <coughs> excuse me, competencies in, in the AI field and uh, enhancing the, the ability to use AI for industry specific applications. The AI Academy provides job specific learning pathway for employees to bridge the gap between the job competency required in the research project and the skill they possessed. Next, please. Uh, in this slide, no. Oh, it's not. I'm yeah. sorry, you, 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 you. Yeah. Yeah, no, let's go. Uh, you modified a little, yeah. In, in this slide, I, I will explain the curriculum operated by the A3 AI Academy. Yeah, yes. The AI Academy offers a large number of training programs with the aim of the increasing the number of employees with the AI skills and ensuring that they are able to, to meet the AI related R&D project. The, the training program consists of five courses and 36 subjects this year and conduct training either through in-person and online learning. The course description of AI Academy is as follow. Business strategy course is designed to provide the goal, a global trend of AI, industry application, and the best practice of AI. Basic course provide overview of programming skill along with the fundamentals of machine learning and deep learning. Professional and in-depth courses provide a deep dive into the state of art in AI and project-based hands-on learning. Lastly, advanced courses provide a real-world problem solving with AI and nurturing professional instructors. In February of this year, AI integrating integrated training course for Korean National Research Institute, Institute was opened. Next, please. Three, uh, yeah, the three inter, uh, uh, international uh, institute at the and uh, KIRD, Korea Institute of Human Resource Development in Science and Technology, and KISTI, Korean Institute, Institute of Science and Information, Science and Technology Information, formed a consortium to provide training for employee of 25 uh, government funded scientific research institute. I will show you in this uh, <coughs> a slide the, the some results. Oh, no, no, the last, yeah. Uh, now I explained the, the result of the A3 AI Academy training program for two years. The AI Academy has a total, total of, of 45 instructors, 23 internals and 22 external instructors. The total of uh, 36 courses, courses were opened per year and 30 hours of lectures per courses. The total of 
3,200 hours of lecture has have conducted since 2020. The number of course completion is a total of 1,400 trainees have completed their courses. In the case of AI integrated training course, a total of 100, 169 trainees from 18 research institutes have completed the course this year, since, uh, since uh, 2021. In the future, we plan to gradually expand the curriculum and open our AI Academy framework for the other institute, not only the uh, government funded research institute for, and also for military education uh, institute and others. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Kim. It's all, so uh, well, the, 10 minutes, yeah. It's yes, right. perfect. <laughs> it's all right. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. So now we will have the pleasure to listen to Professor Nguyen Thi. I just want to say that in the final presentation, will be, which will be sent to all the participants, uh, Professor Nguyen Thi part will be updated with new information that unfortunately we couldn't add uh, in last minute. Okay, just, just to say this. So Professor, now it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Miket Ben uh, Hamidia. Uh, so I'm not sure if you already updated in the, this slide, or should I share the screen? Hello, Ms. Miket uh, Hamida. Uh, yes, 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 yes. I'm just going to put you as a speaker so you can share your screen. Just, I just uh, have to find your name. Okay, now. You should be yeah. able to share your screen. Perfect. Okay, it's great. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, sorry for the very last update, uh, but can you see my screen now? Yes, there. yes, we, we can see it. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting us here uh, to present you about the major domains of innovation and research on applied AI in Vietnam. So uh, to, to present to you some information about uh, applied AI in Vietnam today. So we teams uh, have me, uh, Anto, uh, and also Professor uh, Le Thanh Nhang, uh, and Associate Professor uh, Phạm Văn Tuấn as well. So uh, you already hear uh, many pictures about AI application in education uh, from our previous uh, speakers. Very wonderful, very interesting. And we also hear the sharings uh, in uh, Korea uh, AI uh, policies and strategy. And now we would like to provide you the overviews of uh, our Vietnam Vietnamese strategies on AI development. Um, so, um, so this is the, uh, we come from the DNIT, that is the Institute, International Institutes uh, belong to the University of Danang and also belong to the University of Côte d'Azur, our friend. And we are kind of the hub of research and education training. So over here, uh, we combine different uh, experts from different um, university, different country, international and national scale to, to together build the hub of research and training. And uh, we are very honored to also deliver uh, different program in terms of AI, in terms of IOTs, for example, with the BHAR program here. Uh, so because of that, we want to give you the overview. And after that, uh, if we can collaborate in terms of training and research, that would be wonderful. And that's our happiness. Um, so uh, to tell you about the uh, readiness of our country in the global artificial intelligence development. So in 2020, so we are still in the low uh, rank, but from 2021, so Vietnam already trimmed 14 place and reached the 62 uh, rent in the global AI readiness index. And this uh, work, this data were collected uh, and prepared by each government um, in using AI in public service. 
uh, based on 42 indicators across uh, three main pillars, as you can see in the pictures here, that in terms of the government, like uh, the adaptability, the digital capacity, the government and ethics and vision. Or is, and also is related to technology sectors like the science, the innovation capacity and human capacities or the data and infrastructure. So that is about data representativeness, data availabilities and infrastructures. So the range were make based on 42 indicators like that. And on that, in 2021, Vietnam jumped uh, 14 place and raised the 62 um, place in the range. And uh, it's past the average, uh, average level uh, of the global ranking. Uh, so this has come because of uh, Vietnam already have better preparation in terms of using tools and environment to make use of AI to improve public service and gain economic advantages. advantages. Um, and uh, how we can have the dream like that. So actually uh, our government already have some uh, strategy uh, for AI development, like you can see here. Um, they, our government have the strategy up to 2025 and 2030. So up to 2025, uh, they focus on three main objectives uh, that is promote AI uh, to an important field of technologies of Vietnam. The second objective is uh, make Vietnam become a center of innovation, creativity, development of solution and application of AI. And the third objective is about developing creative uh, society and effective government, protect national security, maintain social order and safety, and promote sustainable economic growth. And the objective for uh, 2030s is also focused on three, uh, these three objectives, but actually different target, different numbers. If you can see that in our first uh, objective uh, about promoting AI as an important field of technology in Vietnam, so at uh, to 2025, we target to be the top five leading country in Asian sectors and the top 60 leading country around the world. But in 2030, we target to be the fourth leading country in Asia and four, 50 leading countries uh, around the uh, international, uh, like global scale. Uh, we also want to build, uh, focus on build uh, from five reputable uh, AI brand, uh, up to 10 reputable AI brand in uh, 2030. And uh, we uh, target on uh, scale up from one national center for Solving big data in 2025, uh, up to um, having like a three national center like that in 2030s. So that is for the field of promoting AI at the important field. Similarly, uh, for like uh, promote Vietnam to become the center of innovation, uh, creativity, and development of solution and application. So Vietnam focused to have two national center for AI innovation and creativity like that and have new 10 research and training institute, but up to 2030, we expect to have like a three nation centers and one representative uh, within the top 20 AI research and training institute within Asian sectors. We also want to have, uh, want to develop the high quality personnel in the AI and also increase the number of scientific work and patents in AI. And the last objective is about create uh, the so creative society and effective government. So uh, the objective uh, to 2025, our government target on public administration affair and online public service. But up to 2030, so our government focus more on uh, like a provide basic skill in AI application for personnel in order to promote innovation, creativity, reduce cost, improve living capacity, work capacity, everything uh, in general public 
And we also focus AI for national defense and security, rescue and national disaster prevention, and uh, also to boost the economic sector as well. So that is uh, some strategy and uh, policy to push to promote AI in our country. And here is uh, what Vietnam already achieved. So in the summit of 2020, so Vietnam already hosts uh, a very big summit uh, talking about just only AI. We name AI Day. And at that, uh, we focus on talking about development of computing infrastructures and expert in AI, how to build expert in AI. We're talking about building AI community in Vietnam. We're talking about AI startup showcase, uh, about how to develop human resource in data centers and AI, or building a bunch of resource in tutorials, and also a routable discussion with all the CEO in the AI field. Uh, that is the activity, but in terms of the fields, so this summit focus on talking about national language processing, AI in tourism, in healthcare, in education, uh, in fintech, and in agriculture. And of course, it's just the very main uh, objective, but not just limit like this. In every uh, university, we focus on different things because we target on smart city building as well. Um, in regarding to the um, government development, so government already have some policy and because of that uh, from 2020 up to now, they already have some achievement in terms of investment policy, uh, management improvement, smart city project, uh, and uh, some other project in terms of digital transformation e-government. And based on that, many service has improve like immigration, open management, digitalization of textbook data, or monitoring data from the environment. So some main things, uh, main achievement of us is like that. And in terms of publication, so Vietnam is uh, at the fifth rate uh, of publication among Asians, as you can see in the graphic at the end here. So all of this are uh, number and data. So we got it from different source of the government and uh, from the ICT uh, agencies in Vietnam. And uh, particularly in the university. So as I mentioned, we have also many projects in AI, not just about AI in education, but in healthcare, in transportation, in agriculture, in many things. And we really want to have the very like a international collaboration with our partner, with our college here um, in terms of training and research project as well. So thank you very much for your listening. And here we have three presenters of us to help to answer any question if you are interested in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, if you can please stop your sharing screen so I can reshare mine. And perfect, perfect. Thank you. And now we will move on, Professor Liu. So Professor, please could you unmute yourself? Professor Liu, are you still here? Yes, perfect, perfect, Professor. So now I give you the floor, it's all yours. You just have to unmute yourself, we do not hear you. Yes, Is that okay? perfect. Yes, perfect, perfect. Okay, let's begin. Hi, dear friends, online audience, and uh, diligent organizers. Good afternoon and good morning. Today, I'm very honored to have this opportunity to discuss and exchange with you on the topic, my areas of research on applied AI at Beijing University and China. As we know, since 2017, China has been vigorously developing the artificial intelligence related industry from policy and economic to support it. AI together with the fifth generation wireless systems, big data and the industrial internet eccentric emerging technology are included into the new infrastructure development. 
2020 to 2022 is a faster period for the development of commercialization of AI in China. AI has integrated with other industries deeply. We look back at the development of AI in recent years. The environment for development and the trend for the development is always in the running state. Policy support, technological breakthroughs, international competition and industrial integration. They promote the development of our AI business can step toward day by day. AI is an important area of global technology competition becomes an international consensus. So how to apply AI technology to empower traditional industry to upgrade and generate greater economic and social benefits will remain the focus of our work. OK, thank you. As we have seen in China, we have established smart computing centers in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hefei, Nanjing and other cities to provide rich computing resources for enterprises, governments and universities to help the development of AI related industries. We also have open platforms provided by famous companies such as Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent and Ifratech to help the landing of AI technologies to be to build AI cities. Next to one. Thank you. Here are some typical numbers to further demonstrate AI in China. Since the State Council issued the development plan of new generation artificial intelligence in 2017, China has supported 80 regions, including Beijing, Tianjin, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, to build national pilot rules for innovation and the development of new generation AI. Chinese AI software and application market size reaches 5.28 billion, about 33.03 billion in 2021 for year. According to IDC report, increased by 43.1% compared to 2020. The first mega AI computer center in East China started to operation in the new area of Shanghai Linga, which is designed to have a peak computing power of up to 3740 petaflops. So one petaflop is equal to 1000 trillion floating point operation per second, and it will become one of the largest AI computing centers in Asia. So this is the, chance, the Chinese artificial intelligence industry three-step development strategy. We took it from three points. First one is the overall technology and application of AI. Second is the scale of the core industry of AI and its related industries. The third one is the overall objectives. This shows that artificial intelligence technology has become the engine for countries to see the high ground in science and technology. Next one. OK, let's look at the development of AI education in China. 440 and 248. There are 440 new undergraduate measures in artificial intelligence have been added in our country from 2018 to 2021. There are, four, there are 248 new undergraduate majors in intelligence science and technology have been added from 2006 to 2021. Our university is the second bunch of universities in China to set up these two measures. Especially, we set up the Qingxin experiment class of artificial intelligence in 2020, focusing on the cultivation of top talents in artificial intelligence. We have many excellent talents for the field, for the field of artificial intelligence, such as Wang Ning, the president of famous sport app Keep, and the founder of Mammoth Web Browser Ji Chao, are both alums of our university. 
On the left, there are four data graphs about academic people and patents contribution in the world. From the perspective of technological innovation, East, Chi East Asia, led by China, has basically formed a highland of AI innovation. I will talk some common applied AI research areas, transportation, finance, healthcare, education, agriculture, industry, retail, and security to, in to introduce some AI applied research in China and Beijing universities. AI in power transportation can minimize safety accidents, and the main research areas are automatic identification of buckling luggage, fatigue driving detection, non-motorized vehicle identification, and so on. Unmanned autonomous driving is an excellent platform to verify many AI technologies. AI in power finance AI in power finance. Next one. OK, AI in power finance can reduce transaction risk and increase transparency of transactions. It can be used for anti fraud detection, stock trading, quantitative trading. And so on. So quantitative trading is very popular now. And AI in power healthcare is familiar and can be heard and seen in many hospitals. Just like Prof. Sham Dawak has measured. For example, AI assisted diagnosis, automatic medical image analysis, and so on, can alleviate the load of doctors. AI in power education is another AI applied area on the on the one hand, it can promote campus safety, and on the other hand, it can build smart classrooms. Especially due to the impact of the COVID-19, smart education is becoming more and more popular in China. For example, rain classroom and Tencent meeting are very, very popular in universities. AI in power agriculture has been and will be the main area of AI applied research. For example, used for agricultural analysis, pest and disease identification, bird identification, and animal identification, AI will make a big difference in agriculture. So here is a video of our village revitalization project in Hunan this summer. Smart fish pond we use Raspberry Pi to process data. Shantan 然后通过那个RS485的转接器 这是一个RS485的转接器，通过室外那个传感器接到RS485，然后转成USB，然后接到数媒派上，可以呃数媒派做到通信，然后可以读出那个传感器的数值。嗯，这个是这个是视频线，视频线通过室呃室外的视频
我们会在画摄像画面中进行进行标注警告，然后同时，嗯，发邮，同时发邮件、发邮件或者其他消息来及时的提醒，来进行进行的告警。那么这样的话就可以有效的避免这个整个监控区域的这个视角，呃，外外人入侵。呃，画面中现在是正在进行投喂鱼群。呃，根据老板的介绍，就是鱼群现在进行进食期间，呃，短期的这个局部的这个溶解氧应该会下降。啊、呃，咱们现在转到室内，我去看一下溶解氧的这个数值。还不是很明显，现在还不是很明显。嗯。现在是在下降，是在下降。Just uh, I mute you yourself, Professor. We cannot hear you. Okay, yeah, perfect. It's okay. Now here is the AI in powered industry, and uh, sorry. So air in powder industry in China is very popular. For example, dump truck identification, safety helmet identification, and so on. Here, I want to emphasize the new area of digital twin. It is a meaningful area. We use digital twin to simulate the full process of industry. We can predict and the trend of the processing and make the process more perfect. Its inspiration is very similar to spectral realm communication calculation proposed by Chinese scientists Chen Xuesen and Wang Chengwei. So here is our AI empowered industry work for mental correction detection. So we you we have proposed a method using deep learning based semantic segmentation method to evaluate the meta correction. We have we have read this paper submitted to applied science and it has been accepted by applied science. We have get the sort of result compared to other segmentation methods. The next one, I will show another. I will show another. AI empower retail is everywhere in China now, such as Alipay, Jindong and so on. It saves the shopping time and makes the shopping transactions more convenient for us. So I will show another amazing work by our student named Self Shopping System for Online Shop. The next one. Oh, sorry. Is it not a video? OK, it doesn't matter. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah. So AI empowered security is a very important and a practical research topic. It is granted in many public areas and used for dangerous goods identification in transportation center. X-ray security screen, file discovery, and reflective clothing identification. So many areas can be used AI technology to empower it. As reported by Ecocean, head companies with more than one billion of assets, next one has reached 21 in China, right? There are also many new companies focused on the AI technologies. All of this demonstrates the prosperous AI research environment in China. Here is the 2022 China AI Commercial Implementation Representative Enterprise Industry Distribution List, including company service, smart city, robot, finance, infrastructure, transportation, and medical. AI has entered and empowered many areas, just as we have seen. 2022 China Top 13 Integrated AI Service Providers here I want to introduce Taurus. This is a company in this list, which our university has an equal interest dedicated to providing comprehensive AI services. This one. Okay. So 
Looking back at human history, an error has its inevitable mission and responsibility. From the first industrial revolution represented by mechanization to the fourth industrial revolution represented by artificial intelligence, nature, society, people, and government are a cycle whole. One cannot be missing. As a university, as a university teacher, our mission is to cultivate excellent talents to fully power the engine of artificial intelligence and to make this whole run more and more harmlessly. Thanks for your listening. Welcome you to Beijing and welcome you to our Beijing Information Science and Technology University. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. So now, as mentioned during the introduction, William Wei was unfortunately not able to join us today, so he sent us a video of his presentation. Please do not hesitate to raise the volume of your device if you want to hear him properly. The volume is maximum on our side, so we can do much more. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is William Wei. I'm the CTO of Foxconn and MIH. Uh, consortium. Uh, today, I want to uh, talk about a software-defined vehicle. Uh, we're building an open EV platform, and uh, um, let me uh, start uh, my slide. So, uh, since MIH was announced uh, in 12 months, um, the MIH opened up for a, a partner to join us. And uh, in 12 months, uh, we have reached more than 2,000 uh, global partners, including some uh, a large company in tech sector and also some uh, startup company who are really uh, excited uh, to, to building this uh, open uh, platform uh, together. So I want to start the, my uh, uh, speech about Mark Anderson 10 years ago. Uh, talking about software is eating the, the, the world. Um, but 10 years later, uh, 2020, uh, the head uh, AI expert from Tesla, they are building some uh, uh, amazing autonomous driving software. And he uh, also say that software is important, but his quote is uh, software 2.0 is eating software 1.0. Meaning that uh, the, the next generation of the software is building out of a, a lot of the AI training, um, building from data instead of building from a human being algorithm. So this trend continue the lead uh, innovation. So the power of software start out with, uh, before I, even iPhone, right? Uh, everybody uh, might be, remembering that we, we enjoy our hardware gadget. All the gadgets are like in a, in a form of hardware. You have to carry them around, uh, uh, including the Nokia, uh, the king of the phone. Right? Everybody in, enjoy a no, being using a Nokia. Uh, but 2007, what happened was by the introducing of the iPhone, everything become, become a software uh, defined. What I mean, software defined is you can enjoy all the uh, functionality without carrying this uh, hardware gadget, uh, hardware phone, and, and more. So you can start taking away all this uh, functionality in your pocket and define, deliver in a software form that everybody enjoy. So software defined is, is no longer a myth. Now I want to talk about the open movement. So starting out the, the, the closed uh, system building of Nokia, right? Everybody know that Nokia phone is the, uh, the best phone at that time before uh, Steve Jobs uh, introduced iPhone. But what everybody not noticing is the, the, introduction, the introduction of the SDK, a software development kit, uh, along with uh, uh, iPhone, this piece of uh, a gadget that uh, people uh, bring in their pocket. But what Nokia doesn't have is this uh, rich uh, software development platform, SDK. And later on, Android uh, 
after I, iPhone introduced and then introduced the SDK, Android also follows through with the SDK in an open source form. And they even go further, open up the hardware platform. So everybody uh, can uh, take this uh, SDK, build a rich software ecosystem. And also they can uh, um, build their, their own Android phone. And this really revolutionized the industry. So the power of software uh, defined and the power of openness really is changing the, the whole industry in different sector. And in automotive industry, we realized that, that we want to introduce what we call open EV platform, MIH. What MIH means uh, mobility in harmony. So we start out taking a look at this uh, a traditional uh, automobile. Now, we, the first thing what we do is to partition the hardware, uh, what we call skateboard. This is skateboard is the um, traditional OEM uh, called a rolling chassis. Basically, this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, engine, combustion engine that taking out and remaining is just a, a motor and a battery driving around uh, without any um, a cap top. Cap top is just a, a design, but this is robust of this uh, skateboard, what we call uh, in MIH is a highway platform. Uh, with, with this, we can put on top of uh, this highway platform, what we, what we call EV kit, the software stack. And uh, to, to kind of graphically uh, illustrate, uh, EV skateboard on the bottom, uh, once we define this abstraction layer as a, as a piece of a, a skateboard that is, can be controlled by command, what we call drive-by-wire, on top of it, we can start developing what we call EEA architecture and putting on some OSs onto this skateboard. Uh, usually it's a RTOS, it's a real-time OS, and it should be a microkernel. It's really a piece of robust uh, OS that on top. Now, the, the modern uh, software stack usually has, uh, besides the OS, usually has this unified runtime, what we call middleware, that open up um, the whole system software in the form of API. And this, this, this uh, a rich of API that access all the vehicle system, uh, we call it EV kit. Now, EV kit is open up for all the developers, third-party develop, developer, including car maker, OEM. So they can start defining this skateboard, uh, a different user experience, what we call apps or application, right? So all the application uh, we divide to, into two domains. One is mission critical domain application, uh, such as uh, autonomous driving or the robust of, of uh, um, functional safety, uh, require application. And then uh, you will have uh, a lot of non-mission critical, a more of uh, user experience rich of application can sit on top of the uh, uh, EV kit. And all these uh, application, including Autosar Classic, mostly uh, mission critical and ADAS, um, over the air delivery o OTA and uh, digital key, all this in mission critical domain. And a lot of uh, Autosar adapted uh, what we call open uh, topic as well as uh, infotainment, uh, such as uh, uh, today you can see Alexa Auto, uh, Android Auto, and Apple CarPlay. All this is in the, your smart cabin. And these are all non-mission critical uh, application. And all this application can call EV Kit. Uh, API that we provided through the runtime uh, to define the future uh, vehicle uh, behavior. So in fact, a lot of application that coming into this uh, platform, uh, we, we, we can see that the first killer app uh, should be autonomous. So autonomous driving um, by, by wire is very critical uh, foundation of um, a mission critical uh, software. Uh, we, we will open up what we call EV kit 
drive-by-wire framework to uh, this abstraction layer encapsulate a lot of the uh, um, very uh, complex uh, vehicle control algorithm and then open up kind of a, in, in a more high language interface to all the uh, application that try to control the car, which is uh, autonomous driving in different level, uh, level two, level three, up to level five, that when you can really uh, take out the uh, steering wheel or your, your paddle and brake. So in fact, by pushing uh, autonomous driving a layer from the system layer to the application layer, we, we can enjoy this vibrant, uh, different type of uh, uh, personalized application uh, to control your car. And you can, you can create a, a marketplace for ADAS, a player to come in to share this uh, a common platform, which is a skateboard that uh, uh, is swappable, right? So it's a, a skateboard agnostic uh, design. Second uh, is the very beneficial for the industry is the commercial application, such as a fleet management or uh, robot taxi. And all this is a fleet management robot taxi is it's a, in an operational term is an API connect to all your fleet uh, vehicle. So uh, today, uh, if you want to build a fleet, you, you, you are dealing with this close architecture of the individual vehicle. Now, EV kit really opened up uh, vehicle architecture and provided uh, different API for access individual um, uh, vehicle to construct a fleet management uh, um, uh, sort of platform uh, for the operator. And so is a robot taxi. Last but not the least is the connected uh, vehicle, connected car. Uh, once the car become 24 seven uh, connected, you will have a lot of smart mobility API that allow EVK to open up for everybody to uh, make the application, uh, especially integrating with a smart city. Uh, uh, smart city has a localization issue because uh, each smart city has a, a local regulation and local rule um, that uh, implemented locally. So, a global vehicle uh, with API open, they can localize to deploy to different uh, smart city uh, easily. So in a way, so in a way uh, we are building up, you know, the industry is building up uh, this EV, what we call the mission critical data center robot. It's not even uh, just a, a a piece of computer. It's a it's a very smart robot with a, a heavy uh, data generation capability. Uh, uh, so we call it a mission critical robot, meaning we have a lot of safety issue that we have to uh, take care. Uh, different from the smartphone industry. How we define a mission critical? We define a mission critical to be a real time requirement and security cybersecurity mostly, plus a safe, safety. In the real time a domain, we have to implement the infrastructure that uh, based on the RTOS, the real time OS and edge devices, meaning uh, each, each car is a very thick uh, edge. And uh, by connecting this edge to, to the cloud, uh, we will make sure that uh, this uh, a uh, functional safety requirement to be uh, a lot of deterministic characteristic, including uh, the OS uh, level and also your SOC uh, level. And last but not the least is uh, because the, the high bandwidth of communication and the, uh, close to real time uh, 5G, uh, 6G, and also we will bring the content delivery network too close to the, the edge and to be a real time. On the security end, um, industry, uh, besides the, the powerful personal computer and the smartphone, we are, we are coming up with this, uh, uh, this is EV that uh, we put hundred, uh, literally hundred of the top um, 
a performance, high performance uh, a computer into the EV. So it's a, it's a very, very um, uh, high computational device and very expensive and, and safety concern a device connect to the internet. So the, uh, so the security, especially cybersecurity is very, very important. Um, we take on the philosophy of uh, the new trend of uh, zero trust uh, security from the bottom up. That the, the, the edge device need to, need to ensure that there is edge, edge, zero trust, edge to cloud, zero trust, and, and provide this end-to-end -end encryption as well to deliver this uh, vehicle uh, <clears throat> life cycle management meaning every vehicle uh, when, when from, from the born to uh, retire, uh, all this is a life cycle need to be 24 seven managed. So we can enjoy the future, what we call predictive maintenance uh, and also remote uh, diagnostic characteristic. About safety, uh, industry has been uh, very mature about what you can, you can, you can uh, hear, um, a lot of this ISO 26262 and the newer uh, cybersecurity related ISO 21434. Uh, this uh, standard need to be observed and need to be followed and need to be certified. The first thing is safety. So we want to make sure that the drive-by wire and sensor fusion, all these uh, fundamental and infrastructure uh, supporting the future autonomous driving is very safe. Um, to develop, uh, allow the application uh, developer to uh, deliver the best in class autonomous of the vehicle. So based on the power of software defined and also the open of uh, way of uh, building up the, the uh, system, the, the, the EV system, there's a couple of uh, a key disruption will happen. First is, so, uh, the future EV uh, based out of EV kit will be enjoying the digital twin, uh, sort of cloud, cloud native, uh, both in development uh, stage to deployment stage, and enjoy the uh, digital twin characteristic of the EV. And the second, it will dramatically reduce the uh, development cycle. So usually you have this big long V shape of the development cycle. It can broken up into more edge agile uh, development cycle and enjoy the latest uh, CICD uh, de development methodology. And the most importantly, it will dramatically uh, reduce the in the entry of the barrier. So all the uh, different domain especially in the software sector that uh, uh, we have been enjoying the, all the innovation from the internet space, from the smartphone and also a PC a computer space. They can all enter the automotive uh, to, uh, to deliver all their innovation. There's one more thing, last, last thing that we want to uh, mention that uh, Paul Gwen, when that, uh, the famous program, the VC uh, Godfather, uh, when, when he saw uh, Tesla, he, he was saying like Tesla S, Model S was like the, the iPhone for the industry, but he didn't see any Android. Uh, there's no, no analog to Android in this uh, uh, situation. So the goal of uh, uh, MIH is to, to bring along this open uh, EV platform, we call Android of EV, uh, if you will. Now let's compare the, um, the, the Android uh, ecosystem. You have this uh, open uh, handset uh, alliance uh, that, that all the uh, third party, uh, either a phone, uh, phone maker or the software player application layer, they can, they can come in to deliver the whole uh, Google uh, Pixel uh, Android experience. Uh, on the bottom, you can see all the app, the framework, the native uh, library runtime. And you can see from our design point of view uh, in parallel from the MIH EV kit. You know, we have the, the similar runtime middleware to open up to all the developer. We have MIH partner now, today is fastly growing. It's past 2000 
uh, today is actually 2,300 something. And then on top, uh, we'll have MIH reference design, the, the final uh, vehicle uh, reference design, uh, together with the reach of uh, uh, application ecosystem to complete the future EV experience. So the vision is to uh, introduce this uh, EV, EV kit uh, open, open platform to bring the, a lot of uh, system layers such, such as uh, uh, AD, ADAS, uh, battery domain, uh, uh, body domain, all this is system level feature, uh, on, uh, push them to, to become an application layer. Once you push all this system feature become an application, you create this uh, open marketplace for a lot of player to come in to redefine what the EV user experience is. Let's talk about a cloud native, let's talk about digital twin. So what is a, a metaverse? Actually, it's a, it's a digital twin uh, scenario. So from the technical uh, view, when, you, when, when people talk about uh, metaverse from the technology and the ecosystem, you uh, commonly will hear that seven layer of the metaverse from the experience layer, from the discovery layer, and then the, the content application creation economic layer and special computing, uh, spatial computing, of course, a 3D experience. And also there's a very important edge computing, this decentralization, uh, microservices, all this are using blockchain in the metaverse, right? NFT as such, and uh, the human interface. And the last but not least is the infrastructure that can support the future of metaverse. So you compare this with the uh, EV kit SDK design, it, it create a very rich uh, application ecosystem and open up a possibility of a marketplace for the uh, automotive industry. And then from the creator economy, um, because you have, uh, you have opened up the system development toolkit SDK uh, EV kit, you can create a very vibrant uh, development ecosystem. Last but not least, because you have this high computing power, uh, 10 or, or 100 times of more than uh, your, your, uh, uh, your iPhone or Android is a smartphone uh, computing core. Uh, you can enjoy literally uh, more uh, 3D uh, experience in, in your vehicle. And also introduce of this blockchain uh, Web3, uh, Mostly, uh, the first is to uh, establish such as a DID, decentralized ID, uh, to play in this uh, metaverse world. And not to mention this uh, smart cabin, a lot of uh, players have started coming in to redesign the smart car cabin uh, experience based out of uh, this high computing power um, infrastructure. And assuming, Every future vehicle is a connected device uh, or the uh, API that connected through the V2X uh, that complete really the mirror of the metaverse uh, infrastructure. So uh, basically I can call that MIH is the gateway to metaverse for automotive industry. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So now we're done with William Way uh, part, which was very, very interesting. Um, so now I will ask Dudu to unmute himself. Yes, perfect, perfect. I give you the floor now, Dudu. In... Yes, you yes now me. I can see you. Perfect, perfect. Okay. It's all yours. Okay, please go to the next slide, please. Okay, great. So, hello everyone. My name is Do, Vice President of Silk Road Business School. I'm mainly responsible for the international development. It's my great pleasure to participate in this webinar today. First of all, I would like to thank our partner, Professor Sergi Miranda, for his trust in Silk Road Business School. I would like to thank the leaders responsible of Beijing Information Science 
and Technology University Director Lu Jin, Dean Tung Wanbei, Professor Liu Chung for their support, as well as professors from India, Vietnam, and Foxon. Thanks to your interest and the active participation in the future development of artificial intelligence in Asia, this webinar can be held as scheduled, and I'm convinced that it will be a good start and a good success. I hope, I hope this webinar can bring some new be sorry, benefits to friends from all countries participating in the conference and teachers and students of Beijing Information Science and Technology University. I would also like to uh, take this opportunity to briefly introduce Silk Road Business School to you. SRBS was founded in September 2015 and is a non-profit organization officially registered in France. It's an independent think tank education institution and cross-border education innovation network jointly initiated by IEAM and International Cooperation Center of National Development and Reform Commission, NDRC, of China. Headquartered in Paris, the main purpose of the organization is to help enterprises improve the development level of globalization and digitalization, and to cultivate cross-cultural, trans-regional, trans-industrial tenants for the governments and the companies of China and also the countries along the Silk Road in various fields. At the end of 2021, Silk Road Business School entered into a strategic partnership with STL and DATAM to jointly establish a joint digital campus in China to cultivate tenants in the field of AI applications. Earlier, we established a strategic partnership with Beijing Information Science and Technology University in 2014. Okay, so here is a quick slide for you to give you a, a quick idea about the global AI landscape. Here, red color parts show us the main countries origins where uh, the AI industry or AI business uh, is located. So we can see that China, of course, U US, and also European Union, uh, including France. So we can see the big players uh, in this AI industry. Of course, to support this, uh, this industry, we need a pool of talents. Okay, please go to the, the next slide. Yes, so here we can see uh, it's a global AI talent tracker uh, from uh, at you, uh, undergrad, undergraduate to graduate, then go to work. So what we can see from this trend, uh, we can know that first uh, there were there is a big gap between the request and the and the offer. So in the market AI, uh, we still need there is a, sh a shortage of people, and this is where we can improve and make efforts to to uh, cultivate more AI people. And in addition, we can know that uh, there is a trend that uh, the, the talent of AI will go to US and most of them want to go to US. So um, China, of, of, uh, especially for the postgraduate work. So, so we need to make efforts to attract, it, to attract the talents, to train them, to cultivate them, and then uh, help them to stay in our countries, in China, in Europe. Uh, instead of uh, letting them go, uh, go to US. So we need to make efforts. So, so here is the market, or there is some space of improvement to do for us. Okay, yes, thank you. And uh, here I want to just introduce you uh, uh, to the French China uh, uh, collaboration of AI. So uh, as you know, AI has been a buzzword in recent years as a, the core driving force for a new round of industrial transformation, our AI will certainly provide a significant boost to social development and human progress. The rapid development of AI will profoundly change human society and life and change the world. The leaders, as you can see in the photo, the leaders of China and France have attached great importance to 
the development of AI. In early in July 20, uh, 2017, the Chinese government issued the Next Generation Artificial uh, Intelligence Development Plan, which sets ambitious targets through 2030. In March 2018, President, French President Macron announced a France national strategy for de developing AI with a focus on the health, transport, environment, and sec security sector sectors, which were already explained by, uh, by professors pre previously. Okay, during French President Macron's visit in China, President Xi Jinping stressed that both sides should continue pushing forward the overall alignment between Made in China 2025 and France Industrial Future Plan, enhance cooperation, innovation, and better achieve advantage complementarities and common development in such areas as digital economy, AI and advanced manufacturing industry. This was followed by also other ministers. And China, France, AI cooperation enjoys a solid foundation and prom promising future. First, bilateral economic and trade cooperation has witnessed steady development. Uh, a sample of a figure to show you. According to official statistics, China, France bilateral trade reached the USD dollars 55 billion in 2017, up uh, around the 15 percentage year on year. Uh, so of course, this was impacted a little by COVID, but uh, we can see there is a big, big basis. Second, China is well positioned to develop AI as we also so in, in uh, previous uh, figures, while well, China falls behind the developed uh, country in terms of basic theories, core uh, algorithm, high-end equipment, and top talents, the growing technological capacity, massive data resource, huge application demand, and open market environment will create a unique advantage for the country. Third, China and France are strongly complementary in AI development. As you know, in addition to the rich talent pool, France has a considerable strength and advantage in digital and computer science research. China, on the other hand, has a wealth of experience in big data and the business models. Despite gaps in areas such as development levels and industry standards, the two countries can, through advantage, complementary and cooperation vigorously tap their potential to achieve mutual development, create a huge economic and social value, and contribute to human progress. We can see many successful examples of education in the education uh, between Chinese and France. We make some uh, alliance, alliance between Chinese French uh, universities and institutions to promote AI. So, uh, so we have universities in China to work with Sorbonne University, for example, to form some France-China AI consortium. So there are uh, many other examples uh, here. I will not uh, show you more details. Okay, thank you. Please let's go to this. Yes, this slide here. Uh, here you I, you can see is our uh, SRPS uh, center. Uh, so um, before before that, I, I was just maybe people will think why a school in the name of business involved in computer based artificial intelligence education, which is also something I want to share with you. As we all know today, artificial intelligence and big data has become uh, the indispensable part of social innovation. AI is not only a science major, but also a application of omnipresence existence, the future of commercial activities and enterprise management will be strongly linked to digitalization and the big data and the application of uh, AI will provide a variety of uh, products and service in our daily life. So our school as a think tank, first of all, it follows this trend closely and integrates into this trend, transforming itself into application field of artificial intelligence business and management and developing some emerging majors such as artificial intelligence and management finance and the market etc therefore on behalf of 
uh, of school, I would like to uh, show you. Sorry, uh, this this slide. This is an ecosystem that we want to create, and here are some uh, some uh, innovation products that we we uh, create for our students, for our teachers, and also for the companies that uh, we uh, we will work with. So here uh, we we pr propose different service and uh, try to make a closed loop, which uh, will uh, create a win-win situation, not only for the students, but also for the teachers, for the professors, and also for the the leaders of the companies so we can know that uh, we everybody can go into online to find the feedbacks very quickly and then uh, find the big match so this is one kind of product that our srps ai tech, tech digital center provide so we are very happy to discuss more with you and try to find a, a different different kind of partnership so thank you very much Thank you, thank you very much. So now we will move on Valérie Ayotte. Valérie, if you can please unmute yourself. Yes, perfect. Yeah, that's okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Mishket, thank you very much. So hello from France. Thanks a lot for attending uh, this event and it's uh, really an honor uh, for me to be presenting. My name is Valérie Ayotte. I am the EMEA director for Oracle University in a department named Oracle Skills Development. Oracle University is the official training provider for all Oracle products and solutions, whatever their delivery modality in class, remote and digital, a lot digital. Our training courses offer both theory and exercise through labs environments and skill check. Our training paths are built to pass a recognized professional certification in the market and as of today, we have more than 2 million active Oracle certified in the world. Uh, my mission, our missions are to create and develop training and assets to provide knowledge and expertise for the current employment needs, but also for the future of work. Uh, our focus embraces many different areas all around the globe, obviously educational institutions, but also customers, skills gap, employer, job specific, industry specific, job readiness and placement, innovation, economic development, and so on. Regarding the importance of the skills for the future of work, or I would say the work of the future, I just can agree and reinforce the different messages provided since the beginning of this great webinar. AI may be the most impactful technology of our generation. AI is the future of every enterprise. It is a fundamental technology. Otherwise, it would be like saying we don't need a website or we are not going to use cloud computing. In an enterprise climate where disruption is now the norm, business is live or die by the ability to meet constantly evolving conditions. AI is at the heart of the digital disruption and data is foundational and critical to the success of AI initiatives. Data is key to most, if not all, the AI use cases. But AI and big data, data are intrinsically connected. Without big data, AI simply couldn't learn. And from the perspective of the team in charge of Oracle's cloud product marketing, they liken big data and AI learning process to the human experience. The human brain ingests countless experiences every moment. Everything that is taken in by senses is technically a piece of information or, or data a note of music, a work in a book, a drop of rain, and so on. Infant brains learn from the very beginning they start taking in sensory information, and the more they encounter, the more they are able to assimilate and process, then respond in new and informed ways. AI works similarly. The more data an AI model encounters, the more intelligent it can become. Over time, as more and more data processes through the AI model, it becomes increasingly significant. In that sense, AI models are trained by big data, just as human brains are trained by the data accumulated through multiple experiences. While you need to exploit the power of AI to reap significant benefits by seeping AI throughout the value chain of a business, 
you need a data strategy for AI if you want to turn data into business value. In the next few years, industry definitions and boundary will get blurry and organizations will move from product to platform-based business models. Organizations will need to redefine their business model, reevaluate their supply chain, and reimagine their customer journey. AI will be integral to all these efforts. I will not deep dive into all the solutions and capabilities of Oracle solutions there, as we could spend hours looking into them. I will rather focus on the use cases and concrete examples of applications and solutions developed thanks to the Oracle AI solutions. So let me just provide you with a high level view on the portfolio of Oracle. I've added a slide at the end of the presentation in which you will find the links uh, to bookmark, to navigate, as well as links to free training on Oracle. There are a lot. Our machine learning platforms have been available for years now. Oracle AI is a family of artificial intelligence and machine learning services. Developers can add pre-built models to applications and operation. Data scientists can build, train, and deploy models within their favorite open source frameworks or choose to benefit from the speed of an in-database machine learning. To address the modern enterprise AI needs, Oracle offers a host of service. So OCI Data Science, which provides a fully managed end-to-end -end environment for building, deploying, and keeping machine learning models healthy in production. Machine learning in Oracle database, which gives a complete data science environment with optimized performance when you have your data within your data warehouse. Data labeling with a simple, consistent experience to make it easy to label your text or images, and then use those labels to customize your machine learning model. A developer layer with a comprehensive set of pre-trained plug and play AI services. In fact, Oracle is making AI accessible to everyone with OCI AI services. Are there any uh, industry limitations for the usage of AI? No, we've seen that uh, previously in this webinar. AI is fundamental and across every industry, there is at least a use case. Manufacturing, insurance, oil and gas, automotive, banking, telecommunication and media, retail, public sector, healthcare. Typically, and we saw that uh, widely during the webinar, AI in healthcare is the future. The world is seeing a global shift toward AI in the healthcare industry. Part of this stems from the healthcare industry transition toward a cloud environment for data management. With the cloud, data is now available on a real-time scale for further analysis. But rather than rely on staff to meticulously come through data, AI enables a much efficient and in many cases, much more accurate process. As AI capabilities increase, everything from internal operations to medical records benefits from integrating predictive modeling, automatic report generation, and other AI features. As an example, CERNR predicting passion readmission with Oracle. Is there only one department within a company interacting with or using AI? No, there are many roles within many different departments in a company. Obviously, IT departments, but also human resources, marketing, finances, and so on. So let's come back on healthcare with the example of CMRA. Children's Medical Research Institute is a premier Australian medical and biological research institute and a registered charity. For more than 60 years, the Institute has been committed to advancing healthcare for children. It has many firsts to its credit, including a first research unit for newborns, microsurgeries technique to help prepare blood vessels and organs in infants and children, as well as genetic disease research. A team of more than 170 full-time scientists and PhD students at the Institute work to save and improve the lives of children affected by genetic disease. Research in various areas, including cancer, neurobiology, embryology, genomics, and gene therapy enable diagnosis and treatment. The organization's experiments produce several terabytes of data. To analyze data from genomic sequencing, 
proteomics, high resolution images from microscopes, numerical simulations. It needed the best computational resources, including fast CPUs and GPUs. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure has helped the Institute to take advantage of big data and machine learning capabilities to automate routine database tasks, database consolidation, operational reporting, and batch data processing. It has also made available much faster to the people who need it. A typical numerical simulation that wants to see MRI about 30 days to perform now takes only five days with OCI data science, regardless of the number of simulations being run, meaning system faster with Oracle AI. Agri Agritech, agriculture, another strategic area, and we've seen that already also. The essential equipment of a modern farmer is rapidly expanding beyond traditional implements, the explosives and, and tractors. This day, you can add sky and space-based cameras to that list, as well as sensors that examine microscopic nutrients. And most, most important of all these new tools is AI, which takes the vast amount of data gathered by those advanced devices and turns it into insights that empowers farmers to reduce costs while increasing productivity and sustainability. This revolution in agricultural technology comes just in time. Climate change is making it harder for food producers around the world to meet the demand to feed growing populations while preserving land and protector, protecting natural resources. As Agritech scales to a multi-billion dollar sector of the agriculture industry, innovative startups are at the forefront of developing these cutting edge solutions. These are companies like Chrome AI and Quanticum, a Brazilian agri-tech startups, where Chrome AI applies AI to analyze large tracts of land. Quanticum focuses on the microscopic nutrients within those tropical soils, and the solution identifies and maps nanoparticles that impact the soil's natural potential to produce food, bioenergy, and carbon. Agroscoot also, Agroscoot is taking on a massive ongoing computing challenge. Help farmers scan millions of images captured from their field to decide if a given leaf is healthy. If it's not, machine learning algorithms built into the company's autonomous scooting system determine if the culprit is one of the disease or pest it knows or if it needs to identify the threat of a new treat. Agroscoot turned to Oracle Cloud to develop and run the system's application and algorithms. Applications updates used to take 24 hours. Now developers do them in minutes. Agroscoot's machine learning relies on Oracle Cloud infrastructure GPUs instances, providing the speed and performance that machine learning workloads demand. These few examples, as well as all the fantastic testimonies we've seen over this webinar, really illustrate why we are proud to be partnering with top institutions, innovation leaders, and providers such as STI and Datum Academy. A master in computer science, such as the online Master of Science in AI and Big Data, EBR, can open doors to many new and exciting jobs. Also, the Gradeo built to address specific skills, provide deep learning in a specific kind of field and are recognized by employers for their real job relevance. Serge Miranda will present you the details of EBR and the Gradeos, which are accredited and certifying path. Thank you very much for your attention. I think, Mishket, I leave the stage now. Yes. My <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, very, you very, very much. Thank you very much, Valérie. Thank you. So, uh, as well as for William Way earlier, Marilyn Yamsi was unfortunately not able to join us today as it is two or three uh, in the morning in the US. So we will display to you the presentation he did during our Latin America webinar on Tuesday. And as for earlier, uh, do not hesitate to raise the volume of your device uh, if you want to hear him. Yeah, my name is Merlin Yamsi. I'm a lead solution consultant at Google Cloud, a partner engineering team in the, in the Silicon Valley. So my, my role at Google is to work with partners typically to co-innovate and leveraging some of the great Google technologies.
would you like your big data, smart analytics, AI, ML, Web3, blockchain, metaverse? So a lot of cool stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start with the beginning because um, as you know, probably uh, Google uh, started, uh, has a mission statement that was uh, defined when the, the company was founded in 1998 which is about organizing the world information leading to data and make it universally accessible through APIs and useful through intelligence. So AI and ML, right? Uh, next slide. So the, the company was really born as a, a data company and, and now is kind of the world leader on, on AI. So, Google Cloud was built to accelerate every organization's ability to, uh, to transform through the data-powered innovation, uh, leveraging the best infrastructure, so the uh, infrastructure as a service, the platform, and industry solutions. So because typically cloud, uh, before you get there, just one minute on that one, uh, cloud makes it usually easy for uh, to store and manage petabytes of data uh, uh, in a fraction of cost. Cloud also gives you access to super compute uh, resources like you can have for a per minute basis. And AI usually need cloud. AI is really made for cloud. That's why uh, there are so much interest in AI right now. Uh, the, the, the potential has been uh, sitting there for, for a while, uh, just only accessible for by a few experts. But now with the cloud, we are finally starting to, to unlock it, right? And, and Google Cloud is opening uh, its tool for that. So this is Google AI. One of the main tools that Google is opening is Google AI. Google AI is about utilizing artificial intelligence to provide efficiency to the world. And, and Google has recognized that the, the AI is solving major economic, social economic problems like you know, uh, user experience, health, education, transportation, uh, agriculture, and more. If you go to the next slide, you, you will see that, uh, in fact, uh, Google has been known uh, that uh, for decades they've been experiencing deploying AI. If you look at the search, search, you have you use ranking, speech recognition, translation. We provide a lot of AI translation algorithm. Uh, driving car, uh, self-driving car with Waymo, right? Uh, so we've been around for a very long time leveraging AI in our own technology. Since, since the beginning, right? And we've been publishing, uh, we're leveraging Google research, a lot, a lot, a lot of um, uh, publication around AI. So probably like eight, more than 8,000 publications as of today. So AI is very popular. So if you go to the next slide, AI is very, very popular, but the challenge is that very few people uh, today know how to use it or even can use it. So our goal is really to extend that to millions more of people, right? We want to bring that to everyone. If you go to the next slide. So one of the um, Google, uh, Google is a, fir a first, uh, next slide please. Google is an AI first company. So the company, the, the employees at Google know how to, to, to do AI. Typically, yeah. Uh, but one thing that uh, we also need in the company is to bring AI to people that don't necessarily know AI, but also want to, you know, know about it, right? Want to talk about it. We want to expand our view uh, of the AI education uh, uh, to, to other people that not just don't use AI. So you have the AI enthusiasts. So people that want to know AI to teach others, and you have the AI practitioners. So people that want to learn AI to apply AI, right? Those are typically the two, the two type of uh, people that you will see uh, at Google. So some people are very non-technical team. They want to know the AI. They want to just know the concept and inform 
for discussions with here, while other want to use it for, you know, really apply it, uh, have the deep knowledge of ML and AI, and want to apply it as much as possible. So these are the typical type of uh, path that you will see in the company when it's uh, when it's about AI. Next, next slide, please. So the, what the strategy of Google? It, Google is really about uh, solving uh, the knowledge, the education challenges by democratizing AI. We want to make it available everyone. We want to make it easy, fast, and useful for not only the expert, but for also the developers, the users, I mean, every, everyone that needs or wants to understand AI. Right? We believe that AI is the fundamental cloud technique that will eventually benefit to all companies. Uh, so the capability uh, of AI isn't just in, in, in question in this, uh, in this, in this matter. So uh, you will see that it's at the point where AI researchers have shown that AI is very powerful, but they just need to be applied to real, real applications, right? So the, the, bar, the barrier for adoption is getting into the hand of the customer now, right? So not only, not only the experts. So that's why we're building solutions that can broadly reach the market, developer, data scientist, researcher, and, and more, so that they can use it to deploy uh, into, uh, into, into the application. The strategy that we're using for that, which we call AI democratization strategy, is to democratize that with education. So we built a, a curriculum that will enable skilled programmers to become AI enthusiasts or practitioners. So you want to use it to train or you want to use it to, to apply, right? We, we have a curriculum that take into, in that into account through the exploration of concepts, and techniques that are, uh, are taught in a very practical and hands-on manner. Right? So next slide. So our portfolio, we don't want to go deeper in the portfolio, but we have this portfolio uh, in a multitude of programs for first for Googlers. So we built that for Googlers from the beginning so that we can use that in the company for our own uh, people to talk about it or to train other people about it or to apply it in our own product. Now, the goal is to share that content to the world and to bring that to the external people, uh, including academic partnership, which is uh, why we are partner with a, a lot of academy to, to expose that, right? And we're using that, we, we're leveraging that through what is something that we call grow, grow with Google. So Grow with Google uh, is, um, is, a, is something that is there to, to wear to, for digital awareness really, in general. So we, we made a pledge that digital skill training, uh, we want to train millions of people in the world, right? So it, it, in that sense, we want to make digital skills available, which include AI, of course, but not only, because digital skills go from basic stuff to very advanced stuff like AI. And we want to impact the career of, of, of personal, of people's life, right? Le leveraging the grow, grow with Google. It's a big initiative that is currently being driven by, uh, by a specific organization inside Google. And if you look at what, why we're going there is uh, 2018, we had our CEO, Sundar Pichai, saying this, which means that Education is changing, right? What he's saying here is clear that people need more options to trip into the digital world. The next generation of worker will depend on how we evolve education and tech in the coming years. So because of moving skills, education need to change, right? If you go to the, to the next slide. So uh, skills and jobs. Right. So in 2019, we expand our strategy to continue to drive what we call digital skills education will merge skills and jobs so that we can connect the critical skills uh, in jobs areas. Right. So that you are not only learning how to do something, but we are also learning because it will be useful going forward in the next generation 
uh, uh, you know, leveraging our next generation of, of people, uh, and including diversity, because uh, we, we, we need to take care of everyone, not only the, the, the experts. Ah, so in, in uh, as part of that, we have decided to create some certification, uh, which is called Google Cloud Certification. Uh, the Google Certification um, is part of uh, Google Carrier Certificate, which are online professional level training designed to help job seekers to grow in high growth field and advance their career in the places where they want, right? For example, here you see three different certificates, a cloud engineer, a machine learning engineer, and also a data engineer, which are some of the top three uh, certificates that are currently being driven by, uh, by, by Google, and which is the one that we're currently partnering with, with uh, uh, STR, MBDS, and, um, and Datum Academy. If you go to the next slide, so we recently signed a partnership with them in October last year to be able to bring those technology, to bring those curriculum to, 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 to everyone, to the, the, to the people in, in the world. So they're currently driving this partnership to bring that in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, everywhere. So that's, that's the main goal uh, of uh, this partnership. Um, now we have reached the end of this webinar. So thank you everyone for being here today. And I would like to especially thank our speakers to, to, who took the time to prepare the very interesting presentation. Uh, if you have registered to the webinar, you will receive on Tuesday the replay along with the presentation document. So if you are a candidate interested in our program, so Master of Science EBR or the Master in Presential in France BR uh, or even our micro credentials uh, gradios, uh, you can contact us at this address. So contact at datum.academy. And if you are a company, a university interested in a partnership, oh, sorry, that there is a quick bit mistake uh, in Asia with us, you can contact us on the same uh, email address. So I wish you all a very good weekend and let's connect on our last event on Tuesday for the French edition of this series of webinars dedicated to big data and artificial intelligence. It will have a focus on Africa and as well as for all our past webinars. Uh, so for Middle East and Gulf states, Latin America, including today's one on Asia, it will sure be very, very interesting. So I wish you all a very good weekend and goodbye everyone.